All right. Hello and welcome, everybody. I believe we are now live. Um, had to uh, make sure to get everything ready. So, um, first things first, as is traditional, I will be. I am opening up the ceremonial starter beer. So, <laughs> today we're going to be talking about recent. Well, let's make sure that everything's going correctly. <laughs> Is it working? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's working. All right. Um, the uh, So today we'll be talking about a surprising, somewhat surprising uprise in, uh, in um, anti-educational uh, legislation. And when we talk about anti-educational, we're talking about things that are specifically trying to limit what teachers can teach and how. Um, this is not just um, K through 12. It is indeed uh, all the way up to the college level. And we will talk about that, but also what um, us as history tubers can do. Um, what this platform uh, this is being streamed both on Twitch and uh, YouTube. Um, but what this these both these platforms are capable of doing, and really social media in general, as public history is capable of helping to kind of defeat the uh, the the anti-educational intent of the this legislation, um, and what viewers can do as both students and teachers. Um, and that's why we might have uh, some other people join the stream partway through, depending on whether or not they're able to. But um, we have here um, and linked in the description, the channels uh, US 101, the person, uh, woo, 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 it's this direction. <laughs> Down there, <laughs> right here. Uh, Sammy, um, who is uh, who runs US One One. He hasn't been putting out a lot of videos recently, but that's because he's been doing a bunch of stuff on the History Channel. Mm. Um, although I'm looking forward to seeing some more Superman content. Uh, you know what? <laughs> you and me both, man. <laughs> I would love to see more Superman content. Um, um, nice, nice to be here with you guys. And a, uh, and you guys probably well recognize uh, Matt Beat here, Mr. Beat. Um, <laughs> doing, the, doing the Brady Bunch thing. That's right. <laughs> Hollywood Squares, yeah. <laughs> um, so the uh, I wanted to start this off with kind of prefacing um, how how we are uh, seeing kind of a new wave because we'll get into how this really isn't unprecedented or anything, but we will talk about uh, what is um, what uh, the continuing uh, changes over time on, um, on this kind of anti-educational bent of legislation. Um, and probably the thing that's in the news the most right now is uh hold on let me hit the uh doo -doo -doo, boom that one the florida um the florida uh uh african-american education curriculum um the african-american history uh curriculum they famously recently rejected ap uh, uh ap's African American history, specifically citing that it contained critical race theory, um, and so basically made their own. Now, the most famous passage in this specifically states uh, that they're supposed to that they're supposed to teach that uh, slaves benefited by learning skills during their enslavement. Now, obviously, that's a uh, pretty abhorrent language and very much playing into the lost cause. But what's not really getting a lot of media attention, partially because it the, doesn't have the vice president actually reading this per curriculum, um, is the sheer amount of, um, of kind of trying to downplay um, 
the uh, trying to play up uh, conservative talking points, I should say. Um, for instance, you'll see right here in the uh, curriculum, there is uh, specifically saying how Eisenhower, um, well, Eisenhower works, uh, how Richard Nixon and Thomas Sawwell are somehow key figures in uh, creating uh, the, the, in reshaping the civil rights movement. Now, you could say they are key figures in reshaping it, but in a very negative way. Um, so that doesn't make any sense. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'll just put this here. Uh, thank you, Tiger Star. <laughs> Yeah, and, I, don't, I don't think that's actually true, but it, it's funny. However, <laughs> I would not put it past Florida. Yeah. <laughs> have them um, why isn't the genius of Vanilla Ice also recognized along uh, like NWA and like, you know, proper hip hop artists? I would not put it past that state one bit. <laughs> now, there's also within this curriculum, there isn't much about uh, there isn't much about uh, anything to present. Um, it very much ends in roughly 1980 um, when it talks about uh, fr uh, teaching African-American social history from 1960 to present um, is a one day class, oh, um, which is just insane. And then pivots to uh, to, you know, cultural history, specifically like how their music is important rather than you know anything that could hit on how inequality persists um there's a very clear attempt to try to move away from anything that might represent the uh represent florida as having systemic inequality even at present that's the thing that they're exactly trying to target and they have done so with this. Uh, I will also point out that at the beginning of the curriculum, there's two weeks that are spent on talking about like conditions in Africa um, prior to the transatlantic slave trade, oh, which God. is weird. Um, you know, it's African American history, not African history, um, and it seems to be a purposeful diversion of that old lost causer talking point of. Um, look how bad it was back there. Isn't it nice that we enslaved them and, you know, brought them to better conditions over here? Um, so, oh, and there's also another really popular controversial talking point is that uh, it talks about uh, like how there's two, so that they need to talk about uh, race massacres as both being, co as, uh, being attacking African-Americans and black people doing the violence too and in all of the instances that they name only one of them actually has more white people dead than black people and that was very specifically because they were defending a building in dc um and you know you tend to take more casualties when you're uh when you're attacking <laughs> a defended position so they're literally cl claiming that that's uh that that's of equal footing and no, it's that's a false equivalency by far. Um, and by the way, thank you everyone for uh, for the the super chats. Um, I don't know if we can get too much uh, distracted by super chats, so I've got to forewarn you that we will not uh, be be doing. We're we're trying to get through the uh, what we need to talk about with before we get distracted. Um, what he's trying to say nicely is if you want the good doctor, and he is a doctor, by the way, give respect where it's due. Yeah. If you want the good doctor to answer your off your, your non sequitur question, you better throw this man at least a C note, at least $100. <laughs> uh, $20 for Howard Zinn's of people history of the United States. Are you a clown? No, man. We don't answer that question. You can for buy that. Uh, you can buy that, that book for way cheaper. You can buy that for <laughs> five bucks on literally yeah. any used bookstore. And, and actually, uh, the Zinn Project gives it away for free, right? regularly um but uh yeah the i am not a fan of howard zinn um if that's uh if that helps answer the question um 
I, it's it's you know a textbook. I don't expect textbooks to be particularly good. He ha- he was a historian, so he did actual history work. But I wouldn't call a textbook like actual history work. It's not um, that's not what it's meant for. It's meant for schools. Um, the uh, sorry, I have to turn on a fan because. I forgot it's going to get hot in here. <laughs> um, the uh, the um, so yeah, he he is also very openly uh, Marxist, which can be kind of self defeating sometimes. So yeah, yeah, there's a lot of problems with it, but uh, we can't spend too much time talking about uh, uh, things that aren't in the schedule. <laughs> Not for twenty dollars, um, no, no. <laughs> No, I mean, it's great. It's, it's, and it's thank related, you very bro. much. Still alive. Also, thank you, Sam Cook. Um, the uh, that was that only showed up for like the split second. Thank you, Sam Cook. But and also thank you very much. Uh, still alive. We just can't uh, do too many distractions. Um, so the first thing we wanted to talk about is previous, uh, how this plays into previous history, because the fact is. We've had this. We've had a. We have a long, long history of um, of using schools for um, for uh, you know propaganda for basically. In, I guess you'd call it indoctrinating. Um, and in fact, you could say that the school system started that way. That it began specifically to indoctrinate kids into nationalism. I know, Matt, you want to talk a little bit about this. Yeah. No, well, that that word is thrown around so much um, by critics of the public school system, like, oh, these children are indoctrinated. Um, but remember, the definition of indoctrinate just means you are teaching uh, someone who's impressionable uh, with an ideological perspective. Uh, you're trying to push... Um, certain certain ideologies or maybe even like values or um, I mean, you could even argue morals, which th- most people would argue you want you you want to teach morals and values, uh, assuming that we all have the, sh- the same morals and values that will help benefit society, y- yada, yada, yada. But often like the original uh, public schools, um, like you said, were heavily nationalistic, um, it's n- not just in the United States, but uh, in Europe as well. And, uh, it's right for us to, to be critical of that. Um, because it's always, I mean, the public schools have only been around, uh, for about 150 years, 175 years at most. And in, in terms of like mandatory, every kid has to go to a, to a certain age. Um, in reality it though, common. it was the, a lot more common in the North <clears throat> prior to the civil war. Um, and yep. I will point out that the first uh, attempt at at nationally mandating uh, school was uh, a big part of the um, of the uh, 1874 election. Um, yep. yep. 1870s was a big turning point. Yeah. Well, uh, Grant actually ran on on mandating uh, uh, education though this was also kind of part of like a anti-catholicism push like a because <laughs> you know catholic schools and all that kind of stuff it was a very anti-catholic school thing um rather than like a national standard or anything it but uh that was the first attempt at a national requirement for uh education i will point out we still do not have a national requirement for education (laughs) yes the other thing i wanted to bring up so like when we think about public education it's not top down it's very decentralized there's uh over thirteen thousand school districts in the country um that each school district even you know has some of these districts have dozens of schools um i mean sammy works in a very large district one of the largest districts in the country um and then within each school, you have dozens of different teachers. And so when you talk about indoctrination, it's just not easy to indoctrinate a kid in the public school system. It's virtually impossible. They, a kid is going to get not only different perspectives from different teachers, they're going to get probably more influence from their peers, because especially um, when they get a little bit older and in, into their teen years, they don't think that the teachers are really that cool 
I mean, no, no disrespect to us teachers, but like they're listening more to their peers than they're listening to their teachers. Especially and so this, at high school. This idea that like all of a sudden, like this kid was like, oh, uh, the parents had so much influence on him until they heard that one social studies teacher uh, in eighth grade that that introduced them to uh, Malcolm X. And then all of a sudden they turn into a radical. This is absurd. Th this whole idea. So like I, I want to stress yeah. like. I in public schools, you get you get tons of different perspectives, not just from teachers, but also from peers. And so, so yeah, like it, I, it, it never really happened that way. I will point out that there, are, uh, like everybody has that story of like that one teacher that like really inspired them to you know go into science or go into history or something along those lines. So the individual teachers absolutely can have a major influence on students, but that's more inspiration exactly um yeah and uh, by the way i see uh knowing better here uh uh knowing better if you want to hop in i actually sent you an invite on on twitter <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if you want to if you want to join in um i don't think i sent you the link but if you would like to uh, uh hit me up on twitter real quick i sent you a dm um because he also has some uh, experience teaching. Oh, that's, I forgot to talk about our experience as teachers. We have oh, none. Oh, my goodness. We have none. We're just here because <laughs> we got bored on a Saturday and we we're just like, hey, let's talk about this very controversial topic with no background <laughs> in it whatsoever. I specifically was inviting people who have teaching backgrounds. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, first, me, uh, I have taught at both the uh, college level and high school level i tr gave uh, i but substitute teaching although i was a long-term sub for uh, about a couple months um but not much in uh in high school but i have been a graduate assistant uh for many years and uh was instructor of record for two years in, uh, until i graduated well until i got my uh, my fellowship last year um which mandated that i literally just do dissertation um but you know two years of of being the instructor of record meaning i was the professor um so uh let's uh let's go with you sammy uh okay cool so um i am heading into my fourth year of teaching i teach in chicago as matt said earlier uh i am part of cps this uh i believe it's the third largest school district in the country behind new york and la um fourth year i'm going into my fourth year of teaching uh i have taught um ap us history honors us history standard level us history and standard level world studies and this year uh once again i am going to be the captain america of the social studies department at my school uh all i'm teaching is a push honors us and uh regular us as well so when these stories come out uh and they specifically relate to history i know myself i know uh Cypher, I know uh, Matt can, like, we can all relate, and I'm sure this all chills us to the bone when we hear and see that these changes are happening to curriculum in parts of the United States. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to, uh, to hopefully tearing this thing to shreds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, yeah, I, I, uh, I have 12 years' experience teaching in the classroom. I started out uh, student te teaching in Omaha, Nebraska. That's where I got my... Um, first certificate and uh, education degree. And then when I moved down to Kansas city, it was during the great recession. So there were no uh, teaching jobs. So I substitute uh, taught in uh, an inner city district um, for a semester. And that was a very eye opening experience for me. Cause then in the spring, I got a position uh, coaching in a very wealthy district in the suburbs. And so I would go from uh, urban to very wealthy suburban, like in the same day, regularly there for a while. That was a very educational experience for me. And then I went on to uh, teach in uh, suburban schools uh, for the next few years. I've taught everything from high school, uh, world history, U.S. history, a push, uh, geography, economics, to middle school social studies, geography, economics, all that stuff. Uh, and uh, my ended my career in um, a rural district, actually. Um, which uh, was actually my favorite. Um, shout out to Tonganoxie High School. Um, <laughs> and the reason why I left teaching after 12 years is because I made more money making silly videos on YouTube than I did teaching, which shows you that this is 
kind of a twisted timeline that we're living in right now. Like, how sad is that? That I could, it's much more lucrative just to make these stupid little videos. I mean, granted, they're educational. I'm still teach. I'm still teaching, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I do sometimes miss it. I do miss uh, the interactions I have with students uh, because they really, as you both can attest to, like I think a lot of it is just like they. they they rejuvenate your spirits. They lift you up. They also teach you, the students can teach you a lot and uh, kind of you, you don't become you avoid cynicism and doomerism. If you hey. are interacting. <laughs> no, I mean, like, you know, like uh, you when, when pessimism, you're, pessimism. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, with the, I like doomerism more, actually. I think I'm going to start using that. Movie. Yeah. Don't be, a, don't be such a doomerist. I always say, OK, doomer. I, I, like, I, get, I, don't, I don't like hanging out with people like that. Like for real, like. I mean, because uh, yeah, it uh, they give me hope for the future, especially Gen Z. So uh, yeah, I do miss that. Um, but at least I can teach on my YouTube channel. So thanks for, for sure. having me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, sorry, I didn't pu put that. Had to kind of like interrupt one thing for another. But I figured that's an important thing to to point out is that uh, I put out a bunch of invites to folks, but uh, specifically for uh, people who are formally in education and so are um you know particularly suited to talk about this um so we were talking about um the origins of of public education um obviously in terms of college that goes back to at least the eighth century um you know the phd was first offered in the uh 10th century you know it's a, a lo way older system um but the uh but typically the k through 12 system is modeled off of the prussian system which was very much about like getting you prepared for the job of being able to be a, a good worker and being um you know loyal to the state um <laughs> especially be, uh, in terms of prussia uh not so much the united states but in prussia it was very much about like uh you know will these boys be good soldiers and will these girls be good housemakers um and you know understand the workings of the state so that they can be more loyal to it um so there's there's that whole basis but it's evolved over time right it's not um while it certainly started with that very nationalist like we're going to teach these americans to be good americans um it's moved to um, from, you know, we're going to teach them good skills to being just well-rounded individuals, right? That's kind of the the entire purpose of education. That's why we still teach history. That's why we still teach, you know, social uh, other social studies that often go around like logic and how to how to do research and stuff like that, uh, you know who who norm, uh, normally needs to be able to do you know trigonometry um after they get out of high school but we are taught that because it's it helps you be a well-rounded individual um and you understand your your place in society is kind of the whole thing not just history but all of it right but that also means that uh putting somebody in their place uh, can often um, give uh, impetus to screwing with the curriculum. Uh, the one that, uh, that probably was the first major attempt and, and actually quite successful attempt at subverting the uh, education curriculum as it became more generalized in the early 20th century was the lost cause um, starting in the uh, uh, starting in the late 1890s and uh, and all the way into the uh, 1950s you saw the lost cause become more and more uh, accepted throughout the US not just in the south but uh, generally everywhere um, you know a lot of of uh, older folks in the comments can sound off and say they probably were taught the lost cause. Lost cause being, you know, uh, slavery was good for the slave. Notice that that's in the uh, in the the Florida curriculum. Um, that uh, 
the Civil War wasn't about slavery, that it was a uh, that you know it was a war of northern aggression somehow, and that the uh, that Reconstruction was meant to punish the South. Uh, those are all very explicitly lies, but they all made it into curriculum, partially because of groups like the Daughters of the Confederacy um, sponsoring school curriculum. So a lot of the stuff like the 1619 Project is specifically trying to fight that, you know, decades gone curriculum, but they're, they're still waging that fight. Um, so, like... Um, but we've seen a change from that kind of like, because uh, that's, well, uh, the lost cause for the most part has been well on its way out. There has been a resurgence of it, of course, and we need to fight that. But it's not really the main concern here, is it? Um, it's been a rising thing since the roughly the, well, I mean, basically the 1950s, um, as People became desegregated in that, that instead of focusing on racial issues, they start focusing on rising communism. Um, or, you know, as uh, as Florida is putting it, wokeism. Um, basically, some sort of boogeyman they can uh, they can say is trying to, you know, destroy, dem uh, destroy our democracy and our institutions from the inside out. Um, you know, and red baiting rhetoric has been around for a long time, obviously, but uh, it really kicked off in terms of anti-education stuff in the 1980s, specifically uh, with the uh, college curriculum scandals of the uh, early 1980s. This kicked off partially because, no joke, Ronald Reagan was attempting to, uh, w was in the process of um, was in the process of uh, trying to set up his library, uh, his future library in 1981, when, just after, after he had become president, and was trying to put it at Stanford because he had been a fellow at the Hoover Institute there. Um, but of course, that angered the students. They really didn't like uh, Reagan. And uh, so they protested and he kind of backed away. And then Literally a week after he uh, he uh, officially said that he wouldn't be seeking a library at Stanford, suddenly he created a presidential board to inquire into uh, uh, attempts to broaden what was then called uh, Western civilization studies, uh, what was kind of your standard history 101 um, and 102. Uh, Western Classics, a course that had been offered in uh, Ivy League stuff since uh, the 1930s, um, was starting to be less uh, about Western stuff and broadened to more world history. Um, and Reagan was fairly successful in, in stopping that, that spread out. And we still have like Western Civ is a pretty standard um, part of the education, even though it was actually on the way out in uh, 1982. Um, so that's kind of where all of this, that's the nucleus of all, all this current stuff. Um, it starts there, but it continues to morph. History never stops, right? Um, so we had in the 1990s, we had a bunch of culture war stuff, especially around the uh, American history standards uh, and world history standards created by UCLA professor. Uh, he's a Western history professor and I can a U.S. West history professor and I can't remember his name. He just died too. Whatever. Such it was, disrespect. Called, it Such was called the national standard. Um, caused a big thing. Um, the, uh, the wife of... Uh, of future vice president Dick Cheney, um, Lynn Cheney, really went after uh, this whole thing. And notice that what we're talking about is still college, though. It took until basically the 2000s that the, uh, that, well, okay, the national standards was about, uh, K through, was for high school, but, uh, but it was a, a curriculum, not 
you know, some pervasive ideology or anything. It was just specifically Congress went after a particular curriculum. Um, but in the early 2000s, there was, of course, No Child Left Behind which suddenly mandated a particular education and uh, standards to be reached uh, to have a high school degree. Specifically, you had to actually like test to get there. Now, that wasn't actually mandating education. It was mandating uh, particular standards for reaching each grade. Um, there was a lot of concerns about teaching to the test and what those tests contained. That went away with the uh, Common Core in um, the late Bush and early uh, Obama years. Um, and then, you know, relatively recently, just skipping forward about a decade, we had the 1619 project that blew up and had a lot of uh, controversy around that. It had a, a national response prompting the 1776 project. We've actually had a previous stream about this, actually two. Um, and you can go check out those. We don't need to get too much into it. I just want to give this like larger uh, that this is this is not exactly something new. What is new is that the, each of those were kind of national culture war battlegrounds that didn't really affect teachers in particular. This is affecting everyone. Um, and so before we get into like the specifics of what this is, I just want to ask you guys what what do you think is different now? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, Matt might have a different answer than me just because he teaches a bit further south than I do. So <laughs> I would imagine that the mentality, the demographics, that everything down there is going to skew a, sh a hair differently than up here in uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, at no point in my time of teaching, have I ever had like a parent or a student or anybody come up to me and just be like, what you're saying is wrong. And what you're saying is incorrect. And how dare you say this to my child and blah, blah, blah. So, on and so to be honest with you, I really don't talk to a lot of parents because we also, again, when you live in a larger city or an urban area like Chicago, you do have a lot of kids that are coming from lower middle income backgrounds and their parents are working sometimes multiple jobs. So it's just hard to talk to the parents about anything in general. But with the parents I do talk to, uh, none of them ever bring up any sort of uh, uh, issue uh, in regards to what is being talked about. I mean, at the beginning of all of our classes, we supply our students with a syllabus that they do have to take home. They have to show their parents, their guardians, and it does have to be signed and returned, which tells me that, okay, somebody verified that you know what you're talking, you know what you're going to be learning about in this class and everything's going to be okay. You're okay with it. Um, but I also recognize that where I live is very much a, a, a bubble of a lot of acceptance, right? Planned Parenthood is still very much a thing in Chicago. Um, I live in a neighborhood where if you walk two, 300 feet away from my apartment, you'll see pride flags and trans flags and, and intersex flags it's just hanging out of people's windows and no one bats an eye. It's, 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 it's par for the course here. But when I see this stuff happening in other States, whether it be Florida, whether it be Texas, whether it be Alabama, whether it be wherever it is, Mississippi, the thing that hurts me the most is that these are now going to be new rules and new policies that are intended to affect the teacher of record in that classroom. They now no longer get an opportunity to perhaps teach history the way that they would like to. They no longer, th th their autonomy is being taken away. You no longer get the opportunity to give kids a full picture of what it is that you would like to show so that they have a broader understanding of history, because that's part of the reason we teach history, right? I, I, I think I, I can speak for all three of us when I say that we taught history or we teach history because we want to teach kids how to be able to tell really good stories. That's at least one of my main motivations, but to tell, but to tell a really good story, you can't tell a one-sided tale. You can't tell a biased tale. You can't say like, Oh, 
uh, we don't really talk about these people. We're going to relegate them to the one colored box on every 20 pages in this textbook. And we're going to focus on the great men of history that were super educated and super willing to put their lives on the line for the cause of liberty. And so, but you forget that all those other people that you're relegating to a footnote play just as big a role as these supposed great men. But these curricular, these curriculum changes that are occurring, like in Florida, for example, you're taking away really good parts of the story. And I know that a lot of people in these states will say, well, we, we, we stop teachers from talking about this because, you know, we don't want to make the white kids feel guilty. We don't want to make the white kids feel sad, right? We don't want to make the white kids feel as if it's like, it's your fault that, that uh, all of this tragedy and woe happened to black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, gay Americans, women in, in the United States. But if you're teaching correctly, and you're teaching students skill sets to allow them to critically think, to allow them to research, to allow them to sift through sources and to take away the main parts of the history you're studying. It's not designed to make them feel bad. It's not designed to make you feel sad or like, oh, it's my fault that all these people are, have these problems in life and we tell you this stuff because you need to know the whole story so that you, as a public school student who is in this school to learn how to be a good citizen, it helps if you're a good citizen, if you know the entire history of the United States, so that you are that much more prepared academically, physically, mentally, spiritually, to make sure that that does not happen again. That's the whole point of teaching history as completely as we try to, because if you leave out major parts of that tale, that's what makes kids feel bad. Because if somebody calls them out on their ignorance of something, cause they didn't learn it, that just makes them feel even worse. And then that might force them to double down on a fact that they firmly believe in, or that colors their, 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 their worldview of, of, of people. I mean, yeah. So we're talking now that you're, you're talking very uh, idealistically what we yeah. you know, what history education should be. Yeah. But the question was, uh, you know, why? What is changing right now? What? Why is this anti woke stuff different from you know the previous attempts at uh, limiting education and that? It's and different because now you're incorporating so many groups into that umbrella. It's no longer just oh. Uh, we're going to stick to a lost cause. And narrative. thank you, symbol. <laughs> we're not just going to stick to a, a, a lost cause narrative and say like, oh, slavery was good and it provided benefits for those that were enslaved and it allowed them to attain more skills and stuff. Now we're incorporating like you can't teach about LGBTQ history. You have to probably limit the amount of history that you can talk about in regards to women's movements in the country. Um <clears throat> You know, like you're incorporating so many more groups into this umbrella. And that's what makes it different because it's no longer just like, oh, let's just target this one group and try not to actively discuss their role in, 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 in American history. Now we're going after numerous groups and trying to minimize their role, their place within this American space. That to me seems like the 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 biggest difference. Plus there's also this idea of like, you know, oh, we have to protect the children and, you know, we have to protect them from these kids that think they're trans or, or, or that they're gay or that because Gen Z, this new generation is embracing this idea of like gender being a construct. Right. And so you have older generations that go, uh, protect the children, protect the children at all costs. We can't, we can't, uh, uh expose them to this kind of stuff lest they, uh, veer down the wrong path. So it's, it's a limiting, not just of certain types of histories of, of one group of people, but it's, 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 it's now become a limiting of histories of numerous groups of people. It's, it's erasure on a much bigger scale, ultimately. Hmm. Um, Matt, what do you think is different? Well, I mean, in the 1970s, uh, it was mostly a time of progress in society um, in terms of obviously economically there were troubles uh, with stagflation and all that but in terms of social issues 
it was a time of um, more broader acceptance of uh, change in society. And then we saw a backlash, a reactionary movement er erupt in response to that, beginning in the late 1970s into the 1980s. And I think there's a parallel with, uh, and the teens, the 20 teens, that is, <laughs> Uh, between about 2010 and 2020, we saw uh, progress in terms of, for example, same-sex marriage became legal for the first just, time. There was I broader. Out, I forgot that I had banners set up for like this is what the topic is. <laughs> what topic we're oh, on? Oh, yeah, all right. You need. <laughs> we, are, we are professors. Sorry about I that. Swear. <laughs> <laughs> but the, this yeah. is what the topic is now. But go on. Uh, yeah, but. I believe the 20 teens were actually fairly progressive in terms of social issues, um, broader acceptance of uh, the trans ec ec community, for example. Um, and I, that, I saw that change firsthand. Like I, I, my students were much more open-minded when it came to, to that type of stuff. Um, and then the, obviously it's always the case where the older generations, they fear change. Uh, they fear what they don't know. And so over, a long period of time they may adapt, but in the, at least initially they're like, what the heck's going on? Uh, and so my theory is actually that actually what we've seen now, we're, we're in the 2020s, we are living through a reactionary time. Um, and the conservative, uh, or I guess those on the right end of the spectrum, to put it more accurately, have capitalized um on the fact that um, these social changes have taken place. And um, and so, um, you know, I think all the momentum is on the left end of the political spectrum these days in terms of economics. Uh, because if you look at uh, the extreme wealth inequality that has been <clears throat> rampant now for decades, um, the Great Recession, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, relief, most of the, the uh, the money that government provided went to the elites and they just like socialism for the rich, as Bernie Sanders puts it. And so you have a lot of unrest with um, the majority of Americans economically because they you're seeing this now with like this anti work movement as well. Like they're realizing, oh, huh, we have all been exploited this whole time. We're working two, three, four jobs and we're our wages aren't really going up still. And right. and so the you know, Republican Party in particular has been like, uh, we can't focus on economic stuff because we don't have any solutions that are politically viable there. So let's just focus on the culture war stuff. And so that's what they pump out to manipulate the masses more than anything. Even independents fall for this crap. Like the transgenders are coming. Oh, you know, that's the boogeyman these days. It will, this will not always be the case. Like I, flash for 10 years from now, this, this will not be in the conversation. But right now, that has been actually effective for them. And that's why presidential candidates like Ron DeSantis has like went all in, even though it's probably going to backfire for him, because he sees that as a political issue that he could win because some independents fall for this minute, um, this uh, propaganda, uh, this fear, this transphobic propaganda, basically. And so because we're all focused on the culture war stuff that ta that spills over into the schools because. Um, you've got to have scapegoats. You've got to blame something, you know? And so, uh, well, parents, you know, they're busy working two, three jobs. <laughs> and so they're like, uh, well, these, our kids are, are with these teachers all day long. Maybe, maybe they're the ones who are teaching them that it's okay to be, uh, a, you know, a different gender, uh, or whatever. And, and so, yeah, like, that's why I think, uh, it's not rooted in reality, <laughs> um, but that's, I think that's why we're seeing this right now. It's so sad too, that like the more right end of the spectrum, as you so eloquently put it, uh, <laughs> is, is, it is so much more focused on a culture war, right? As opposed to, you know, cause traditionally to be a Republican, you know, whether you want to be Rockefeller Republican or Reagan Republican, like one of the biggest things that was like on your platform was fiscal conservatism. Right. Right. Yeah. And it, but I, I wonder now if that topic has just become, well, because here's the thing, fiscal conservatism, fine. But at the, at the same time, the people that are traditionally celebrating and voting for uh, right-wing uh, Republicans now are those elite people 
are those one percenters, those that have all this money and don't have to pay a lot of tax on it. So I feel like why talk about fiscal responsibility if uh, if the people that tradi- that are voting for us now are still doing fine? Like, let's not focus on that anymore. Let's not build a policy. Let's not build a platform on, you know, trying to save money, trying to uh, uh, shrink the size of the government um, for financial purposes. No, let's, like you said, let's focus just on culture war stuff because that's easy. That's mm-hmm. the easy thing to do, right? It, it's so much. Would you rather sit so, down and listen to somebody for an hour talk about like economic policy or would you rather have someone say like the transgenders are coming with guns across the border to kill your kids? It's like, what? Like, it's so yeah. much easier to, to rouse somebody up with a much easier argument. So Pat Buchanan had a uh, had a perfect way of describing what you know, why one remember Pat Buchanan was not just right wing. He was far right um, and, you know, had a lot of interesting things to say about the Jews. Um, so the, the uh, you know, this is obviously coming from a far right pundit, um, but he. He had a way of phrasing. He also gave the phrase uh, "culture war" in the first place. He kind of like was the one who coined it, um, and he called it the Ho Chi Minh Trail to Power. Outstanding. And, and if you think about it, it's it has it's about going the roundabout way, going outside of politics, you know, outside of Vietnam, <laughs> and going you know like Cambodia and Laos, and going down to South Vietnam where uh, and taking power that way so moral panics obviously not something not anything new right. you know if you have democracy and you want to protect the kids then you got to kill socrates um, well and, and before pat buchanan <laughs> before pat buchanan there was jerry falwell uh and the moral majority that's right that, that's where he, he came out of that as well um and mm-hmm. so religion is always there as part and in particular a certain yeah. Uh, usually it's fundamentalist um, Christianity Even that kind of yeah. is kind of leading the charge against the, the public school system. Though, the, uh, though there's also a, a Catholic right. There's a, uh, you know, yep. there, Oh yeah. That's my family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, You're the my, ones who put under God in the pledge. I see. I see. I see. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually true. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, in terms of answering this question, the, the, what is different about this current wave? Because you know we're we're illustrating a lot of like uh, continuity, but there is something different that is. Uh, and I'm trying uh, to stretch for the next topic. Uh, there is something different, and we'll come back to this question. Um, is that teachers are afraid to teach now? Mm-hmm. There is a very real fear. Um, I know when I was uh, interviewing at a uh, university in Florida um, that it was a big concern about like whether or not they could even hire me because I am such a public figure and whether or not I would like become uh, a focal point of of derision from like, you know, if, just imagine if I said something about, you know, Ron DeSantis, while I was employed by a Florida university, I won't say which one, um, and uh, and uh, you know suddenly he tweets about it and it becomes a whole thing, and then suddenly you have teachers, professors, actually getting fired. We just saw that happen, in fact, in uh, Texas. Let Texas A and M. Yeah. Is it A and M? Yeah, it is. The, oh, there it is. There we go. Um, Texas A&M just uh, just suspended somebody for uh, for we don't actually know what the comment was. It was just some sort of snide remark about the lieutenant governor, and um, and she got reported by one of her students, and they made like a big public outrage, public outcry about this, and she was suspended within hours. I think the comment Ours. was something. I think the comment was something along the lines of like, "I'm not a big fan of his shoes." <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is something different here because this is this is uh, and like it's not just at the um, it's not just at the college level. It's not just at the K through twelve level. It is widespread and pervasive, and it's at the state level. That's actually why I named this stream uh, state level 
anti-woke legislation because this is for the most part the federal government has nothing to do with all this stuff there's nothing in the constitution about education it all well, goes yeah, to, but, to states yeah but the federal government obviously has an influence i mean we talked about funding how, uh, how the federal government had influence on previous uh but, but not until but not until recent decades only you know the <laughs> department of education was created during the carter administration and in terms of like um most of the funding that wasn't actually the first department of education that was like the fourth when was the first department of education 1870 something it was actually the department of education yeah, it lasted for a year. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. You got um, me on that. But no, anyway, but, I'm just saying, like, it's Teddy, a, it's a, Teddy it's Roosevelt a real... also created one. I believe there was one under the New Deal as well. There's, there's been multiple. The one that we currently under is a split off of HUD, so that's like a whole different thing. Um, anyway, but my point is that, and it, thank you, exploring the, history. The federal government generally has, uh, in even in recent years. Uh, just completely stayed out of education other than, okay, uh, we will assist a little bit with funding, but it's mostly, most of the funding that they con concentrate on is at the, the college level, like uh, student loans. Mm -hmm. And so like each state, like it's radically different. I live 30 minutes away from the Missouri border. Um, I always told my students this as well. If you go to a classroom 30 minutes away, you're going to have a actually fairly different curriculum. Yep. Um, and, you know, yeah. in Texas, for example, uh, they get a whole, uh, I believe, two full years of Texas history exclusively in, in Texas. Um, two? That's what, some, that's what <laughs> some of them, if anybody's from Texas, confirm in the chat, but like. Also uh, confirm if you're from Texas, if part of that two year history is, should we go <laughs> back to being the Republic again? <laughs> That, but those I mean, were some bad years for Texas. I know, but they're so proud. <laughs> they're so proud, though. Yeah, but, but also, uh, even California within had states, the Lone Star flag before they did, though. So, ha. Oh, oh. Within states, there's such uh, there's diversity of curricula as well. You have, um, you know, districts that s some of them have very strict curriculum guides yeah. that teachers have to follow. Um, one of the uh, very large district that I worked for before, that was the case. And then I, in the rural district, I had much more freedom to just choose the content that I wanted to teach. That said, all teachers virtually emphasize skills over content, emphasize yes. lessons over like at you least, have to memorize these names and dates. That's at least ridiculous. recently that it, that that's something that kind of changed yeah. with Common Core. Right. Yep. Um, and yep. by the way, to to kind of push back on the whole idea that the federal government doesn't have anything. The main reason why Common Core became popular was because of the federal government, uh, was because they tied in like infrastructure funding and that with, ex uh, with taking oh. particular funding. That's a, you know, it's a way around the constitution, you know, because the constitution is, does not actually grant the federal government pa the power to regulate, uh, 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 curriculum or any curricular mm -hmm. or anything but like you know you tie it into funding and all that kind of stuff and it's like a little roundabout way it's like oh you want if, well i mean you can have bad roads but <laughs> <laughs> um and also i believe uh i saw somebody um i think his name uh, oh chat's going quick uh jose yeah jose said that um that uh there is that it's probably um Texas two years is one year in middle school and one year in uh, high school. Correct. Um, so that that makes a little more sense. Although I remember in uh, in Nevada we had one one year, I guess you could call it, but uh, it was like the third grade or fourth grade, something like that. Yeah. So you know, it, it like in in elementary school you're all in one classroom the whole time say for like you know music class or whatever um but so um to get back on target um we we were talking about how this is uh, there is state level legislation that is uh changing things and yes the federal government does have a say but for the most part right now the federal government doesn't have anything going on uh in terms of this like anti-woke stuff um and you'll notice that 
we aren't defining woke because they refuse to define it. <laughs> um, so we won't either. No, they define <laughs> it. They, when we say they, we mean people who use the term woke. They define it, but they all have different definitions of it. So it's, exactly. it's basically true. meaningless. Yeah. There's yeah. no Webster's definition. And then it's, the best part is when you have a lot of like specifically right wingers, they ask in press conferences, they're like, what do you think the term woke means? They're like, um, and then they just go blank for about like four seconds. <laughs> Because they don't I mean, know. Because it's just it's just I, a tri- think, it's just a trigger word more than anything now, now. Ron DeSantis actually had to define it in a lawsuit recently, um, and he defined it as recognizing that systemic inequality exists. I guess I'm woke. It's like he's so close. <laughs> it's like he's so close. It's like you're almost there, son. You're almost <laughs> figuring it out. Good for it's you. Like, it's like. Yeah, it does. Duh. <laughs> right. So, but, uh, so obviously, uh, you know, a lot of the time it's talking about like diversity in, in media. Uh, it's talking about like, um, oh, an, any kind of attempt at equity and inclusion. Um, you know, the, the, that's big, scary thing, diversity, equity, and inclusion and all that. <laughs> um, although I will say it is kind of annoying how often I've had to write. Uh, I have like a standard diversity, equity, and inclusion statement for uh, when I'm applying to academic jobs. Now, that seems really weird to anybody who is outside of academia, but inside it's just kind of like, yeah, you got to do it. <laughs> it's just kind of a rote, like... It's just thing you have I, to do now. I mean, I literally just co- or copy, uh, like, I asked a bunch of my professors and was like, can I get your statement? And then I just like, you know, Cut and paste a bunch of other ones and kind of make you, it my you, own. Uh, you chat GPT it basically is what you're <laughs> the, well the, done. Probably what like if if that existed when I started writing that thing, then yeah, I probably would have. <laughs> That's how little effort I put into it. Um, obviously, yeah, there there is specific targets with this legislation. So uh, there's a banner here. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so. The the first thing, and I actually need to add something to that banner. Hold on a second, mm-hmm. um, because we were discussing just before this, like, you know, what am I missing? <laughs> um, the the one thing I wanted to go back real quick, and I want Matt's take on this, because again, Matt, you taught you teach what well, you taught in Kansas, which is you know further south. Um, I mean, in the, I mean, I know you haven't been in the classroom like full time for what, two years now, something like that. Yeah. Okay. But prior to that, was there ever any instances that you saw with teachers in your district or teachers maybe outside your district, but still within Kansas that did experience issues with needing to teach something because it's been dictated to them or, um, being told not to teach something specifically because it may be seen as part of this like woke movement, whatever it is. Like, do you have any examples of that at all? Have you seen that? It didn't happen when I was in the classroom. Even okay. the, even the last year I was there uh, in 2021, it was uh, that was a rough year because it was like COVID. Um, COVID. Yeah, COVID year. So I was teaching students online and right. in the classroom, uh, and that's if you remember, that was around the time when a bunch of um, for lack of a better word, unhinged parents started showing up at uh, school board meetings across right. the country. And it seemed the first like one on this. <laughs> and it all, you notice it all happened at the same time. And it's because all of these parents, you know, they watched uh, the Daily Wire or whatever. The, the same media. They all consumed the same media. They all repeat the same talking points. And so well, they all showed up. And that s- it all happened di- just after uh, Biden came to office, right? Yeah. yeah, and critical well, race theory was invented. Exactly. As, so, well, it wasn't invented. It was already, but I mean, it became like repackaged as this Mark boogeyman. Rufo, uh, Mark Rufo, a right uh, wing, uh, very right wing, another person who uh, has some interesting tweets about uh, the Jews. Um, <laughs> it's always and, it's always Jewish people. Like they're not doing anything. Just yeah. like, let them hang out. Like just. <laughs> like, <what> the- <laughs> <laughs> but like the. Uh, so very much a far right guy who shouldn't be given any airtime, but because he started spinning this whole tale about, uh, about critical race theory, CRT, uh, he started basically a moral panic. And you'll notice that moral panics are typically right wing um, and are used specifically when the right is out of power. Um, 
that it became a big t talking point basically because Biden was in office. Remember that whole Ho Chi Minh trail to power? Um, now, I'm not saying that they're like, you know, deviously planning to, to take back power by starting culture wars. It's just an easy way of scoring political points. Mm -hmm. And so he stirred up this panic about CRT. And you're talking, oh, uh, knowing better corrected us. It's, it's Christopher Rufo is the, the name of this guy. If you, oh. Chris, Christopher Rufo, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, knowing better. <laughs> Mark Ruffalo's an actor. Mark Ruffalo is the Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Knowing better, yeah. Uh, I should highlight that comment. <laughs> well done. Um, <laughs> that guy's smarter than all three of us. So, I mean, you know. <laughs> um, but the uh, the um, the CRT panic uh, turned into this just crazy soup of people showing up at like uh it, all those viral clips of of people going up to uh school board meetings and that uh the thumbnail of this of this um of this uh stream if you look at it is actually a school board meeting and i took that picture from no joke an article explaining how you can go and attack your school board <laughs> like it, like it's literally a how to be a jackass uh, at you know your school board marvelous that's that's where i got that picture that's the tutorial <laughs> that people need that's um, that, that's what they need now i did have a parent that was angry at me once that the in the rural district um because they found out that i taught because we we teach about all the major world religions mm. uh and uh, they found out that we i taught islam. about islam yeah uh -oh. of course you oh, no. and so uh i had a long phone call and then the principal stepped in which he was very supportive of me um, and it ended up okay. We, we, I smooth talked and all this. And I was like, Hey, it's just, I, I didn't, I don't make the curriculum, you know, it's, <laughs> and I just sent, sent the curriculum to, to the parent. And, um, that was kind of like an eye opener too, but for the most part, parents for most of American history, you could say, or most of public schooling history, they don't really pay that close attention to what is taught in the classroom is, I mean, we're yeah. bit, I mean, I'm a parent. I, I, I'm CRT busy. He is just it plain isn't taught. Yeah. Um, so they wouldn't know They they just are trusting something and they don't, most parents do not look at curriculums. No. Most parents are too busy with their own lives, work, working their two or three jobs. Uh, if they do pay well, attention we'll to school, about how that it is, is changing. <laughs> if, if they do pay attention to school, his, you know, historically it has been extracurricular stuff. It has been sports, uh, particularly in suburban districts, that seems to rule over everything else, which is why a lot of uh, bond issues, why all this extra funding that uh, wealthier school districts, they spend a lot of that extra money on athletic facilities. Yeah. Yep. Olympic right. sized pools. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. It, and by the way, uh, this is an example of just like how the right is weaponizing this CRT panic. Because the idea, the the panic is that, uh, that um, you know, they're teaching white children that they're inherently racist, right? right. That's right. that's the that's what they're scared of. That's and not so, what's actually and I, happening. And I'm so good man, at it. Yeah. I'm so good at it too. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> I scare these white kids like nobody's business. Oh, we love, we love, <laughs> we love to teach kids to hate themselves. Let me explain something to you. If I, by the end of my first day at A Push, I don't have all the white kids in my class, their eyes bugging out their head, just dreading in fear, I've not done my job. <laughs> <laughs> don't. They're gonna quote you at a concert. I know. I know. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's a um, and. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, knowing better can't uh, can't join uh -huh. the stream, but uh, yeah, it's great to have him in the comments. Very much so. Um, the uh, the <laughs> he already spawned. There you go. Um, but it's great to have him in the comments. Uh, but this uh, the CRT panic, you know, actually was kind of grassroots. While well, you had uh, Christopher Rufo. Uh, you know, drumming it up on Fox News and that it's the fact that people were actually turning up at school districts and like and making a commotion in that that 
suddenly Republicans realize this is something I can I can campaign on. You know, you might remember that in 2021, the word that they were afraid of wasn't woke. It was cancel. Um, but now they're specifically trying to cancel. That is like literally the purpose of this. It's to cancel particular ty uh, types of history being taught. Now, I wouldn't actually argue that they are trying to bring back like the lost cause in that. I, I know that's kind of like an easy talking point. It's more that they're trying to uh, avoid discussion of um, difficult history, that they're literally banning difficult history, right? And you know what that says to me? That says that you as a school district, you as a school, you as a state, you don't have faith in your educators. You think that despite all the schooling that they went through and, and, and all the rigor that they had to go through to be able to come out the other side with a teaching degree, you still think that they are incapable of navigating difficult history at a high school, middle school, or collegiate level. Yeah. And, that's, and that's the sad thing. It's not just teachers don't get paid. It's also teachers don't get respected. It's a sad state of affairs when, again, like you're literally creating curriculum to make sure that, oh, we avoid these specific type of topics. We don't want to upset the kids. If I know how to teach this stuff correctly and I put power in the hands of students to be able to teach them how to critically think so that when I provide them this content, they can sift through the sources on their own and come to an understanding, then it's fine. Like job done. But the mm -hmm. fact that these, but the fact that state governments are looking at teachers and going, oh, we did just avoid it because we don't want to have a whole conundrum on our hands and stuff like that. And it's just, so you don't trust your educators to teach, to do their job. You literally are relegating them to the role of um, like babysitter because you're and earning I, just as much. And I want to bring this to like very specific legislation because realize we're, we're still talking about like, uh, you know, the kind of popular grassroots, mm. just go and yell at your school board kind of thing, which does actually nothing besides kind of scare teachers. Um, but now there are laws. Exactly. <laughs> so now we've got the policies in place. Most most uh, mm. important is uh, the kind of leader of this has been the uh, has been Florida. Um, but there has been a g general following of this. Florida passed the uh, the Stop Woke Act. Somebody worked real hard at that acronym. Oh God! Uh, <laughs> and and oh, two um, minutes. The I don't even care about what the actual title of the bill is. Everybody just calls it the Don't Say Gay Bill. I know yeah. DeSantis hates that name, but I don't care about whether or not he likes it. That's exactly. what everybody calls it. Um, we don't we don't call the you know 1924 immigration uh, immigration and uh, naturalization act we call it the quota act <laughs> but like the uh, the the um, don't say gay bill um, basically says it started off with only uh, K through third grade that you weren't allowed to uh, to have anything that mentions sexual orientation or gender identity it which how do you not how do you not say somebody's a you know man or a woman um but like the uh you know it, it's the same thing where it's like i don't have pronouns it's like what's that mean <laughs> you know that what they mean is they don't have uh they don't have transgender and ideology so what this uh, that eventually moved not just from third grade, but the actual Florida school board moved it to saying that all Florida schools to be accredited have to uh, not teach gender ideology or sexual orientation. Um, now, you don't teach those things. That's just something that will come up. Um, and the Stop Woke Act actually allows parents to complain to the school board about any kind of devi uh, divisive, divisive, I don't never remember how to say that, divisive uh, uh, 
uh, concepts and that will mandate the school board to uh, to to rule on whether or not that is allowed in the classroom. Um, and I've had personal experience with this because because uh, uh, when I was applying on that, I had to discuss with the uh, with the um, what's it called the search committee um, my curriculum because in a few, in a few years uh, Florida will also have passed at least in uh, anything that receives state funding, which is basically everything, even private schools. Um, to continue to receive that state funding, they must uh, they must uh, allow at the college level um, school boards to review college level curriculums. Imagine that. That's like uh, that's like th they that have include, thrown that, academic freedom out the window. Does that include privately funded universities too? If it receives any Florida uh, to to continue to receive uh, any Florida. Uh, uh, money, which actually a lot of private schools do receive. Right. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Who are these people on this school board, though, to know how to review a college curriculum? Yeah, right. Like the like, the, 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 the random 45-year-old board what, housewife that, like, decided to run for a school board because I don't like what they're teaching in the schools. Yeah. But, like, you're going to look at an academic document and, of, of at, that much, of that level. And, and be able to we will actually, this is actually part of the, we will get to that. Um, soon enough, we, we will be talking about this. But like, I mean, like that's what, but that's my whole, so school, uh, uh, oh my God. Okay. So if these school boards are elected, these are not people that are necessarily coming from academic backgrounds that are seated on school boards. They come from myriad backgrounds, right? It depends but, on the, it, it depends on the school district. I think Florida alone has something like, uh, like 300, something like that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, that's why we can't really talk about like specific school boards or anything because they are, they're all different. Right. Yeah. Um, you can, have, you can have massive school boards. I know like my, my, the school district I grew up in, uh, Clark County school district in Southern Nevada, uh, is one of the, is like the fifth largest school district in the U S um, because Nevada requires that all counties be one school district. That's actually like constitutionally mandated. Hmm. Um, and it actually causes huge problems. Clark County School District typically ranks fifth worst in like everything across the board. I wonder why. <laughs> um, but like the, uh, the, um, so we can't, the, some school boards are elected. Some school boards are. Some are, um, you know, actually like composed of scholars and that. Like the the uh, the Florida school board, the overall one that uh, that designates curriculum, the one that just did this African American thing. Uh, they actually hired, uh, you know, PhD African American studies folks, right, to to do this. Now they weren't. Uh, they weren't. Uh, uh, completely composed of that. It's a mixed group, um, but the uh, the curriculum isn't actually just you know some some yokel that they, that just happened to got to get elected because he started spouting off about how all the woke people are ruining everything. <laughs> like these are uh, there are very much like African American studies scholars. But the uh, thing is, like on it, that board. But it's it to go back to your larger argument. It's just, I mean, the fact that you, in your search for a job, because you know you you've busted your ass for your PhD. I would assume now you'd like to enjoy the fruits of your labor by getting you know paid and having a, a proper position, <laughs> um, or not. I don't know. Maybe she's got a PhD for funsies. Uh, no, <laughs> who knows? But <laughs> but. But yeah, the five, fact that, but five the fact, years of rigorous study just for yeah, fun. yeah. I can't, <laughs> I can't wait to read the book when it comes out, man. But um, I mean, the dissertation should be published anytime soon. I, sick. I it, they said that at the end of July. It's at the end of July. Let me know, man. So send me a copy. <laughs> but, uh, no, but I mean, the fact that you have to go to search committees and you have to present a curriculum that might then potentially be reviewed by a group of people that you don't know and are all coming from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different, uh, different moral centers. 
And if they look at your curriculum and one of them goes, hmm, not sure if I really enjoy the cut of this man's jib when it comes to this curriculum, you're out of a job. Like, well, it's not that you get like fired or anything. No, that's well, not, not fired, that. But, like, you might not even it's... be considered for a position. Oh, well, yeah, that's that is the concern. In fact, that was like why they were like, can we see one of your uh, one of your curricula for uh, US 101? Oh, US 101. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you show them one of my videos, going for a job interview, you will not get hired. I promise you. History but, one, uh, 105 or 106, which is right. uh, the first and second half of, of US history. Or right. I think they changed it to 1110 and 1120. Um, I'm about to, I'm about to stupid numbering. Name. I don't yeah. care. I'm about to change my <laughs> channel name. But uh, no, it's just, it's just, I mean, I, to go back to your question from much earlier regarding all this moral panic and are teachers afraid to teach? Oh, we'll get, we'll get to that. That's going to like be the, the final question. Yeah. But I mean, like just in regards of like all this moral panic, like, I mean, uh, just to briefly touch on it. Yeah. Why would you want to go into education if, if, everything that you might potentially do in a classroom is monitored and potentially reported. I have to submit uh, X number of lessons or X type of curriculum uh, to an independent body that I'm that it, that is not in charge of hiring me, but they get to review my lessons, my work, my curriculum to determine whether or not I'm suitable enough to be in the classroom. And then when I'm in the classroom, I then have to follow these new student policies or state policies, these state mandates saying that I can't teach about LGBTQ history. I can't teach about certain types of, of history when it comes to maybe black American history, so on and so forth. Like it is scary. Like why would you want to go into a field that seemingly in, in not everywhere, luckily, but it, it, but in some places it seems if like, as soon as you get into the field, you're immediately shackled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it, it, what you're describing is that it has a chilling effect, right? Yeah. I, that it has a chilling effect on teaching. And th that's like the worst thing for teachers because like you want us to be like excited to do this. You know, like we, we want, uh, you should want us to be there. You don't want to have that teacher who's like literally just teaching from the book. Um, but that's essentially what this stuff is mandating that you're going to teach from the book and the state mandated, uh, you know, anti-woke curriculum or anything, um, you know, instead of anything that we're passionate about. And, um, you know, this is leading into, uh, uh, this is leading into, uh, you know, we're talking about the divisive concept bans um, having a chilling effect, but this also has a chilling effect on students, right? On teachers, uh, on uh, not teachers, on um, parents, right? This entire thing is, is causing parents to lose trust in the uh, educational system. And so a lot of them are opting out. Right. They're going to homeschooling. And Matt, I know oh, you just recently did an episode. Uh, was it yesterday? Um, the, uh, talking about like some very propagandistic homeschooling educate uh, uh, stuff. So, uh, yeah, the, the uh, oh yeah. Um, so I just based on my research, it, it's it appears that homeschooling has been on the rise for at least five years, and this was this trend was happening even before the pandemic. Um, and you know, I as a parent, I often get advertised uh, force-fed homeschooling curriculum material. Um, and so I uh, I think this was in 2021, I got a, an ad um, that advertised, it, it was a, I didn't know what it was at first, but it was, a, it, they try to make it seem like it was for, you know, it was edu educational materials. Um, and then I came across a book that they had created the company is called Everbright Media, and this is a series they call the Kids Guide. And the specific one that I reacted to, and I did this on a Twitch stream, a couple of Twitch streams, was the Kids Guide to Fighting Socialism. And so I just released a video, like looking at the highlights of it. But it, it's pure propaganda. Uh, I, I obviously, it's uh, I, I personally, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of socialism, uh, especially in, in terms of federal government. Um, but to to not be too long here, but 
it basically right off the bat gives the wrong definition of socialism to kids. And the whole book is just uh, lie after lie after lie to promote the agenda that capitalism is perfect and that anyone who uh, taxes uh, the rich uh, is a is anti-democratic and all this stuff. Um, so, you know, it's, it's heritage foundation stuff basically. Um, and yeah, like this is, a uh, over 500,000 families have purchased this. Um, and there's other ones too. Well, it's according to their own media. Oof. Yeah. According to what they say. Uh, and a lot of it's overpriced. It's not free at all. It, you pay like 21 bucks for a DVD a DVD. They sell a DVDs. DVD. Yeah. Um, and it, that's just one example. Creepy uh, <laughs> I had viewers point out that, oh, yeah, haven't you heard of the Tuttle Twins? I'm like, the who? And yeah, the Tuttle Twins is another series that is also doing similar things because of the rise of homeschooling, you know, trying to indoctrinate children with uh, to <laughs> basically grow up to be uh, politically to the right. And uh, I want to point out and uh, knowing better is is uh, sounding off in the comments because there were a couple of <laughs> people trying to defend homeschooling. Now, there's there is reasons, good reasons for homeschooling, for instance, uh, you know, autoimmune diseases, uh, you know, if you have something where you literally can't be around people too much, um, you know. The, there's also a left-wing reason for it. There was a lot of left-wing uh, homeschooling. Um, Still because, is, yeah. Yeah, and so it's not purely a left or right thing, although it is far more to the right than to the left. Um, but the, uh, but it's also pretty much guaranteed to be worse education. Not only because, um, you know, the you can't expect most parents to actually be good at teaching. <laughs> like there's a reason why we have studied for so many years on how to do this, uh, you know, pedagogical standards, but uh, uh, in terms of that, but also like just knowing our, our subjects um, is, is such an important part of that. And you can't expect somebody to be fully rounded uh, and teach all the different subjects. That's why a lot of the time for the rich, if they want to do homeschooling, they just hire a, they just hire tutors um, or send their kids off to, uh, to, you know, go on the grand tour of Europe and all that as it, as was uh, how education often worked in the uh, 18th century. But like, you know, that's for the rich. When we're talking about this kind of grassroots homeschooling movement, it's typically specifically to, uh, you know, remove those liberal influences. Um, and the, uh, it's to, uh, extract the kid out of, um, any kind of outside influence, which is literally cultish behavior. It's um, anti antithetical to critical thinking. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like, we, we want our kids to be critical thinkers and, um, it, this is just a shortcut to oh, say, hey, oh, just believe, just shut, just shut up and believe what we believe. Mr. Terry's um, here. He's been here um, a while. Yeah, yeah. He's been here for a while. I, man. I, <laughs> I missed the comments. Uh, I sent you an invite too, Mr. Terry. Yeah, buddy. Come on, <laughs> join us. Come on, Terry. Just sitting in the comments, all nice and cozy, relaxing, not having to worry about working. I should probably uh, send him the link now that I uh, call, called oh. him out. Get in here. <laughs> I think it's I think um, it's interesting that with with homeschooling, because I vividly remember during the pandemic when my first year of teaching was remote. Like that was my first that was my first year of teaching. Right. I, I spent seventy five percent of the school year in my apartment. Yeah. <laughs> what hair? <laughs> But I find it funny that like you have this rise like of people that, that he doesn't yeah. have his hair ready. <laughs> but I find it funny that you have a lot of people that talk about like, oh, this homeschooling movement or like, oh, the, the kids will learn better at home. They won't be indoctrinated with all your liberal no talking points and so on. So these are the same parents that during the pandemic were bitching about the fact that my kid is at home all the time and I can't take it anymore. <laughs> yeah. These are the same parents. How am I supposed to take care of my kid all the time? I have to go to work. I have to do these chores. I have to do this. I, and now you want me to and, make sure uh, that they sit in front of a computer and be in charge of their education for eight? That's not my Mr. job. Perry, I sent you uh, the link on uh, Twitter. So just follow that link. 
But that's but like it's it's so hypocritical. It's the fact that like by the way that Tuttle Twins picture that you posted on uh, on Twitter, Matt. Yeah. I love that like they were holding a shield against collectivism. I'm like, oh, so you don't believe in volunteering? <laughs> you don't believe in volunteer organizations? <laughs> we're looking out for other people. Cool. I appreciate that you're like very much in that 1950s individualist mindset. Well, they uh, want to abolish the police. Apparently, they want to yeah, abolish the police. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> If you don't believe collectivism. in collectivism, you don't like the fire department. You don't like ambulances. You don't like right. hospitals. You don't like yeah. the police. And All right. Something, something you point out in that video very – oh, here's Mr. Terry. Sweet. By hey, way, how's it going? I don't know what you meant by Twitter. I know it as X. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't even know. Goodness. I don't even know what that is. So, <laughs> uh, so um, but I want to introduce uh, – to have you introduce yourself and your like uh, education background and everything. But uh, I also want to address one more thing on the homeschooling stuff is that uh, there's also the, the social aspect of it that you are like depriving your kids of, you know, that playground experience and uh, yeah. like all the, all the different things that come with just socialization. It's, it's a necessary part of, of growing up. I mean, like nobody likes getting bullied, but it's a necessary part of it. Do you, do you know? know? Do you know how many kids after we started coming back into the classroom? There are so many kids that just don't act right. Yeah. That during well, no, because during the pandemic, it sort of bolstered their social anxiety mm -hmm. to the point where you still have students that come to school now. We're like what two, three years since we were fully remote. They're still coming to school, full jacket on, full hood on, hat, mask. They're literally trying to shelter themselves as far away from people as possible because of that time spent away from being socialized. Because part, part of the whole thing about like uh, the reason why this is such an important issue for everyone, not just, you know, the right, but like us as teachers is that this is this is when they're most impressionable. Right. Absolutely. Um so I want to, uh, I want to uh, continue on that, but Mr. Terry's here yeah. and uh, let's have you talk yeah. about, uh, you know, your education background. Sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. No, thanks. I saw that you're streaming and I saw who was on here and I saw the subject and immediately I'm like, yes. Did you not see the, uh, awesome. it, uh, cause I invited you like I, a few uh, days was on, ago. Was it on X? Anyways. <laughs> yeah. <X>. Anyway. <laughs> uh, okay. So yes, I am currently a, high school public educator okay I teach history and um i yeah have a bachelor's degree so in history education so i got that and i've been teaching for about 12 years now and yeah still in the classroom and all that do my youtube thing as well so anyway um so yeah i've been yeah i've been through everything you guys have been talking about i've been experiencing and currently experiencing where are you and, based out of man yeah i'm in utah okay um so the place yes, that banned the Bible recently. Yeah, <laughs> we, we have an interesting. Yeah, we definitely have an interesting kind of makeup here, because um, of course we have the, the heavy like Mormon influence. Um, but it's interesting because as devoutly you know Christian and it, it's a conservative state. Um, I don't think I'm not. I don't think I'm getting as much of the radical backlash as what's coming out of the Bible Belt and all that stuff. Like even though it's heavily Christian, I find at least with. Like Mormon culture, they're a little bit better, or I mean, a little bit more um, sympathetic towards like like immigration because it's you know so many Mormons they go on missions, uh, they mm -hmm. serve missions for two years, go to other countries and that kind of stuff, and they're not like, yeah, they're they're not as like like heavy in, in far right stuff. A lot of them are not into yeah. like uh, Trump or something as much. In fact, yeah, it was a push for like a de we had a decent push for a third right? candidate in our state in the last. Evan McMullen, if you guys remember him, like it's kind of interesting. So the experience is a little bit different, but it's yeah, still, still, I'm I'm getting the same stuff back that you guys have been talking about. Although I I, I do have a question specifically as a Utah history educator. Yeah. Um, do you teach about the Mountain Meadows Massacre? Well, so mm -hmm. there's a Utah history class that everyone takes. It's in seventh grade seventh grade so these are like 12 year olds right way, way so better than fourth for me <laughs> I, I i did not hear about that until i took honestly i took utah history in college went to university of utah that's one of the requirements everyone takes it i didn't honestly didn't hear, hear about that until yeah i was in college now are they teaching it right now in uh in seventh a seventh grade? grade class 
Probably not. I don't see why. But kids, kids can't handle a little massacre. I know it, it, it's hard because it's, it's like who's responsible for that massacre? Uh -huh. Well, uh, well uh -huh. it's yeah, that's the thing. It's like it's it's a a, a very very difficult to uh, topic, yeah. especially in Utah, because it yeah. is you know this the uh, I'm forgetting his name, Oliver Lee, right? The guy the, who did it. The the one who got executed for it. Yeah, that was Lee. Um, well, it wasn't yeah. Oliver. It was a. Uh... Whatever, yeah, he got ex. He's something, the only one. He, something Lee. He took. He took um, all of the. Yeah, all of the. The blame for it and deflected yeah. off of Brigham Young but, and all that. John Lee. But John I Lee. will point out that John Lee was the adoptive son of Brigham Young. So, like, there's this kind of like. <laughs> there were well, a lot how of. How high does this go? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like, yeah. how involved is the church? Obviously, in in south in southeast Utah, like you know, St. George area, sure. uh, south southwest, southwest. <laughs> um, you know, St. George area, mm -hmm. because the actual massacre happened within like uh, what fifty miles of the Nevada border. Um, yeah, up there, more like almost like Cedar City, which is a little bit further north than that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, St. George was actually a smaller settlement than Cedar City at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cedar was pretty big. But, uh, you know, th there's all these larger implications and, and like, you know, especially for Mormons, it, it's this kind of uh, the, the most popular writer uh, of it. I'm forgetting her name. On the, I can't, on the, on I can't the see my bookcase. <laughs> on the massacre? Yeah. Oh, okay. I can't, I can't see my bookcase, but she, yeah, uh, I know she about. didn't it, get excommunicated. Yeah. Her friend who wrote uh, like Blood of the Prophets or something like that did. Um, and uh, they were close friends and everything. And she ended up moving to the Nevada side of Mesquite so that she could basically get away from all the Utah <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Um, and like, so another reason why I know a lot of this stuff is because it's actually kind of like, local las vegas history yeah um, i mean they're yeah gonna be passing through yeah well i mean it's you know overton mesquite that area right there and then what's often called the arizona strip is uh is you know the uh was where all this was go uh, was where all this controversy was going down and like all the way up until the 1980s you could get excommunicated for even mentioning the Mountain Meadows yeah. Massacre. It, it's only barely, the state itself has only barely come to terms with it. Just barely come to terms yeah. Are you talking that. about Juanita Brooks? Is that who you're yeah. talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's her. Fascinating person. Yeah. That was coming out, I remember when I was in taking Utah history, that book was just about to come out when I was in college and our you know, professor's like, this is going to be you know, the big one, the big Wait, book uh, to that, come that, out. And... That book came out in like 1958. You're not that oh, old. Never mind. <laughs> there was another one that would have come out in the oh mid 2000s. Uh, probably uh, an American massacre. Um, that it? I forgot. Yeah, that one came out in like nine of the one that came out in like 2008. Yeah, um, yeah I'm very up much up on the historiography on this. If you couldn't tell, it's okay. a it's southwestern it's American violence. Yeah. It's, it's like what you specialized in. This is your house. Man. <laughs> yeah, your yeah, house yeah. Right yeah. Um, but you can see also this this it kind of brings up a, a larger thing is that you know this is a way of rehashing uh, all this stuff about like anti-woke stuff um is a, a way of like rehashing old battles over over this stuff you know like i don't know if there's any fighting over like try uh, teaching about the uh mountain meadows massacre i would say it's one of the most seminal events in utah history so it would be kind of an important thing to teach about and well, if they're not it that is a gross failing on on utah history well, hopefully just the utah war in general and i honestly i don't remember hearing i don't i mean i was there's you know, a huge Korea. debate over whether or not that's like a to war. be considered part of yeah. that because i mean all uh, yeah there's like no actual fighting with the, utah the, war. the tension i should say that was yeah there was the well, tension that that's what that led to so I'm, indirectly there so honestly i need to, i need to ask the junior that, high teachers what they're doing about that right now yeah i'm certainly with brooks who, who grade, says that, that it was kind of like part of those larger tensions the same way that people talk about like you know the selma witch trial uh, selma salem, <laughs> selma. <laughs> salem witch trials were uh were kind of a witch trial. you know part of uh, were part of this like larger fear over the glorious revolution and all that kind of stuff um 
you know, that there are larger things that can cause these kind of more localized uh, panics, which is also what we're going through now, right? We're going through a moral panic. Um, you know, trans people happen to be one of the targets, but is that really what it is? And let's bring it to specifically the one part of this little Chiron that uh, we haven't touched on, which is book bans, specifically like we talked about the, uh, the um, you know, removal of the Bible, which I'm pretty sure was basically a troll um, saying, you know, oh, you want to, you know, a, remove smut from the library. I may tell you about the Bible. Another um, Utah, another Utah thing. That's what yeah. somebody did. In yeah. Response. yeah. I kind of love it, but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I want to point out that this is um, far more pervasive than any specific books, any kind of specific uh, thing. Um, there's a lot of that kind of um, removal uh, the the ability to say that this is divisive and get it removed from the library to the point that last year um, there was a uh, there was a record high and yes record high higher than the 1950s high, uh, I think actually the comic book stuff was 1949 I might have been getting comic that books wrong. were like mid to late 40s into the early 50s and then Frederick yeah. Wortham comes out the, in the 50s the the mm. big what was the book that was like you know the the book that like really spurred it on um the the the, the uh from back in the day yeah for comics comics was ec comics ec comics was no i mean uh, no i mean not what they were attacking the book that like said that it was like corrupting the children oh uh, uh there were there were a few i don't think it was just specifically one if you read seduction of the innocent by frederick wortham that's it yeah yeah that's that's his book that he writes but in the book he points out um, not just one specific book. He points to specific, uh, like various comic books. Yeah. And he talks about like, this one does this, this one does yeah, but this. I, so I was on. talking about seduction of the innocent yes, itself. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I remember reading a book called uh, 10 cent plague and it's so uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> it's so and, good. And it's like so much of what's happening now is pretty clear parallels, right? Um, we haven't had any book burnings yet, yet. Um, I hope to do don't even like throw that out there. Like as like a, as a, as a, maybe like, I, I hope that it never gets to the point where we're just like, Oh yeah. Did you hear about the book burning? Like, fuck. Yeah, like, the number of times I've seen people talking about like, you know, book burnings are what Nazis did. And then on Twitter, they'll put like a picture of book burnings. And it's like very clearly like 1949 freaking, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. like Kansas or something like yeah. that. <laughs> Because you'll see, like, I mean, so a lot of, like, the, I know, like, a lot of the, I know a lot of the book burnings that happened in the United States in the mid to late 40s into the early 50s um, were specifically comic books. Yeah. Comic books were the thing that a lot of people saw as a, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people saw as a scourge uh, 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 of the youth. They yeah, thought that especially it, since kids love them in particular. Yes. Yeah. Kids kids love them, which means we have to get rid of them because they're going to turn them into uh, criminals. They're going to turn them communists. They're going to turn them gay. They're going to turn them into murderers. They're going to make them not love their parents anymore because they're going to rather um, wish that Superman was their dad instead of their actual <laughs> dad. I'm serious. So <laughs> what they did was they it, it started in it started in private schools. Catholic schools were the ones that kind of led the charge on this because the Catholic Church saw a in lot of these Kansas. I keep on saying that for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, I know. Talk about no in Smallville there were book burnings, um, <laughs> but no, the Catholic Church was the one that sort of led the charge on this because again there were a lot of comic books that were being created at the time that went against the the the, the moral code, the moral upstanding of the Catholic Church, and so they saw it as a scourge. And so these priests and members of the church started writing to publishers and saying, uh, and writing to also like law enforcement and saying, you have to get rid of these books out of these stores because they're, 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 they're harming the children. Right. Meanwhile, kids at this point, they're starting to hide comic books underneath their bed to make sure their parents don't find them so that they can read EC comics. They can oh, read, cri they can read crime suspensories. They can read Superman, Wonder so, Woman, Batman, whatever. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's happening now. Right. Uh, it is because because we have we have we have reached a point that we are actually having more bans per year than back then, 
And that was really bad. I mean, there were literal book burnings. Oh, yeah. Well, um, but there's, there's more population now. I, I would say, uh, and also, we need to really stress what is the definition. I'm a definition guy. I'm a dictionary guy. What's the <laughs> definition of a moral panic? It's a widespread fear of uh, either a group of people or a specific thing that, oh, it's a boogeyman. It threatens all of us, and it threatens our values, our identity, right. but, it's, but it really doesn't. It's, it's just made up. Like, it's not actually a threat at all. Uh, mm -hmm. But the satanic panic of the, the 1980s, like freaking Dungeons and Dragons was something <laughs> that like was great. this board game that and then uh, I it's mean, it's going to turn it, your kids into witches. So it's, it's not just books is my point. And it, it could be anything. It's, and it, you know, people who study history, it's just like, OK, here we go again. And this will this will be over with, like I said, in a few years, we're, there'll be the new thing. We are in a reactionary period right now. Mr. Terry, do you think we're in a reactionary period? Do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, it feels different. It happens. It's, it's heightened. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 The For thing sure. is right now is like what I find in terms of like book banning. I just find it hilarious. The books that they're actually trying to ban. Kids books. Now, I know one that specifically got a lot of traction for a minute was a book about um, a penguin baby having two penguin dads. Right. And, mm. and they were just like, well, we can't have this in our schools. It's terrible. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to destroy the children. I'm like, it's an animated child's book about a penguin. What exactly do you think is going to harm the child about, well, a, about a penguin? It's, 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 I mean, like... I don't know. Like what what the, fuels the what fuels these moral panics is we a perceived threat to the status quo yes. more specifically a perceived threat to the hierarchy. When the hierarchy is threatened, the current hierarchy, oh no, we who have power might be losing power. That's what starts these these all of it. And Not only a hierarchical moral panic but a heteronormative hierarchical which is panic. which is uh intersexuality i know that's another trigger word too. yes it's, oh, yeah. it's linked to power though it's all linked together yes Inter, uh, intersectionality inter did i say intersexuality <laughs> inter, inter <laughs> inter yeah, thank you for intersex correcting are, me. Uh, intersex are but uh, <laughs> there are, there Sorry are about children, that. there are children watching son Calm down. <laughs> you need to boycott this stream you need to burn this stream <laughs> book burn this stream right now take Save your laptop children. and toss it into the yard but uh, yeah, there, there's um, this. It, it, there are some books that are uh, like, uh, for instance, on this. Uh, uh, hold on a second. Get them over here. The this shows like some of the books that are being banned. And like, look, I get banning like Lolita, for instance. That is a, that is a. Not a good book. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Um, and it's like, I get that, like, you know, especially in like a high school library, like, why do we want high schoolers reading about like, you know, pedophilia? They can't um, handle it. They can't, their brain is not, if their brain is not c capable of really processing it, then I understand, okay, maybe this is not, but generally though, I'm a free speech, a true free speech absolutist. I'm someone who was sheltered heavily growing up. I was not exposed. Like I couldn't even watch a rated R movie until I was 18. And I think the whole organization that does the rating system says you can watch it when you're 17. Yeah. No, my parents said 18. I was completely sheltered <laughs> and it it's screwed me you. up. I was, I feel like I'm still trying to catch up as a 41 year old <laughs> in my life. Seriously. Like I, like my kids are not sheltered and you know what? They are bored out of their minds with a lot of this stuff. Right. They are like the more you expose to kids, the more they're just like, OK, whatever. It's not like you're going to like recruit them to be gay because they saw a gay person in a book. It's all about <laughs> it's all about it's, it's all about normalizing something. Right. Mm -hmm. If you could, Matt, I can totally relate to because I grew up I grew up with immigrant parents. So for me in my house, no MTV, no rock music, no that because it was going to lead you down a path of sex, drugs, and stuff that I wish I had when I was younger. But <laughs> what I'm saying is, so I, so I understand, but here's the thing. It's all about normalization. Moderation in some cases, sure. There are certain things that, yeah, you probably don't want to expose like a small child to like too early on. However. Because, by, they, because you might traumatize them. Heaven forbid. Yeah. But 
it's all about normalizing something. If you're normalizing, if you're not making it taboo, if you're not clutching your pearls every time something comes up, you're like, <gasps> can't do, ah, protect the child. If you don't make a big deal out of it and you actually sit down with your kid and actually talk to them about the thing that they're going to watch, the thing that they're going to read, the thing that they're going to listen to, when they get older, they're just going to go through life going, oh, yeah, that's just like whatever. Like it's yeah, not even it's, it's not even a big you, deal. If you make it taboo, they're more attracted to it. Yes. If you ban it, these books, they are more likely to want to read them. It's the cookie jar analogy. If you take the yeah. cookie jar and put it on top of the fridge and you tell your kid, no, you can't have these. They are going to construct the ladder out of anything that they can get their hands on and get that cookie jar one way or another. That <laughs> it, It's the same thing. In terms of like the book banning now, I know a lot of book bans right now are, are targeting a lot of graphic novels these days. Mouse is one that's being targeted. Oh God, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's really Mouse that's yeah. is horrible. Which is a which is a phenomenal masterpiece. If you if no one here has read Mouse, please go pick it up at your yeah. local at your at your local comic shop. It is worth your time and worth your and, and multiple read throughs. Mouse is is being um, banned. V for Vendetta, Sandman. Preacher, like all of these graphic novels and trade paperbacks that are that are coming out that are very, very, very good stories. Persep uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Persepolis, um, which is a graphic novel written from the perspective of a young Iranian girl during the Iranian Revolution and how she made her way through that. Um, all of these books exist to provide you with that different perspective. And on top of that, you're providing a different perspective to kids that want to get involved in literacy, not just by reading the words on a page, but by being immersed in a world that they can visualize. It's I, I so in my high school, I built our first ever comic book library in my library. When you come to my classroom, you will find mouse Sandman Persepolis V for Vendetta Watchmen Watchmen. Another one that they, that uh, they're trying to ban, which is phenomenal. Um, I get at the middle school level. That's not a. That's not for middle school. I mean, yeah, there, <laughs> but it, but, it, but again, nor, normalization, yeah. normalization, but moderation as well. I agree. Like, be like, read this, but when you're a little bit older to understand it. Yeah, I'm not going to take it away from you. Like, if you want to read it, read it, but read it when you're a little bit older, so you have a little bit more understanding of what the main message Alan Moore is trying to present. But so, yeah, go so, ahead. So you know, we're talking about book bands and that, and not, so, uh, but. You know, we we have discussed what all uh, what is actually being done. You know, what what is the uh, you know how this came about, how the uh, you know the the or the specific legislation in that. But I want to turn this specifically hinging on book bans and talk about like how this is being used, how this moral panic, how this uh, how all of this legislation is actually being used because. In reality, a lot of, of people who are are you know going to to um, you know uh, at, what, at school boards and you know talking about CRT or how like a particular book is smut and all that kind of stuff, a lot of that isn't so much spurred on by by like having a very specific agenda behind it. They're just freaking out because they've been told to freak out. Let's focus on who's doing the telling, um, and specifically what that does, and change the ticker for th that specific reason. So, there has been, you know, I, I kind of mentioned earlier how this has been a way of rehashing old arguments, right? Bringing back things. You know, we talked a little bit about how, like, the lost causes come in making a resurgence. Um, how that Texas professor got fired uh, for for speaking out somehow we don't even know how, um, and uh, you know how there's this huge amount of of uh, book bans, uh, curriculum approval, all that kind of stuff. Um, but also we're seeing a resurgence of right wing media in the classroom now. Uh, Prager U has been in the classroom the entire time. Um, there, you know, I knew teachers. Uh, I, I know uh, I know teachers who use it, but it wasn't officially approved. That's something quite different um, that has happened just recently. Um, we have official approval of of right wing propaganda in the classroom. Um, 
you know, already discussed how the uh, how book bans are at a record high and all that. So there's kind of an agenda behind all of this, right? It's being used by the right for something. What is that? Um, I'm gonna let you guys discuss that. I need to go and grab a refill. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. What... Terry, you're you're yeah. newer to the conversations. What yeah. do you think? Um, I, I got eat. <laughs> so you go ahead, Mr. Terry. <laughs> That's right. And I got wheat thins. Um, I don't have I, shit. Well, I've, I go I've, got, I've got liquid bread. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they believe it's to, they think it's to balance out the the messaging that's happening right now more than anything at least that's what they'll say and hopefully that's the the point they just feel they like they should be a balanced approach so if you're going to show this one thing well let's also show show this other thing let's watch this you're you're doing something on slavery let's show the Candace Owens video on slavery or something like that but so you, I, that's what I think they they uh that's what they think is the the motivation so. but would you agree that there is then an issue with that both sides ism aspect, right? I mean, yeah, of course you can always say like, well, what about it's, it's what about ism, right? Well, if you're going to talk about this, well, then what about this? Or what about that? I mean, you could do that all day, sure. but yeah. in doing that though, you remove yourself from the actual argument at hand and you try to focus on, uh, I, I believe Matt, like in, in his uh, straw man argument video, um, put it perfectly. Like you're focusing on something that is not the main aspect of the argument, but you're instead trying to deviate so that you can keep some sort of like circular motion going without ever getting to the root cause. Okay. And to me, like that then becomes the problem. Well, okay. If we're going to teach about slavery, let, let's focus on a part of the curriculum in Florida. If we're going to teach about slavery, uh, we also need to tell the kids that, well, some of the skills that these slaves use were actually uh, beneficial to them and actually made them better human beings. Okay, I'm pretty sure James Hubbard, when he was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson, didn't want to make nails all day and then create charcoal at night so he could try to raise money to escape to Alexandria and to Washington, D.C., only to get caught at the last second and then beaten and flogged while Jefferson watched. I'm pretty sure that if he had the choice of making nails at Monticello or doing anything else, pretty sure he would have gone with the anything else option. And like, it, it, I, I, I don't know. Matt, what do you think, man? Well, I would say the, yeah, at the root of, if we want to get at the root of this, I mean, um, systemic racism is something that I would say the vast majority of folks who lean to the right, uh, they say that systemic racism does not exist. They actually firmly believe that. Uh, contrary to all the overwhelming evidence um, that shows that it does exist. Um, and so that on top of, I mean, I mean, obviously in schools, that's what we have been teaching that, you know, uh, they don't also like this, uh, it, I guess, for lack of a way of putting it, postmodernism um, <laughs> explains a lot of the rise of, you know, uh, pseudo intellectuals like Jordan Peterson, like I'm a pseudo intellectual too, by the way. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, like, oh, oh, excuse me. I, me. Excuse I, I, me. I, pretend, I pretend to be smart. I pretend to be smart. I'm not really smart. Anyway, but postmodernism freaks people out too. And so if you want to even get even more to the root behind that, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. I think it's like the, it's a threat to the hierarchies that we've long seen established. And at the top of those hierarchies, I'm not going to like name specific groups, but we know who they are. We know who has overwhelmingly in the United States who has the power currently in society. Right. And when, it, so when we see the hedge bets with majority of power. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so the, 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 whoever threatens that. Uh, and yeah, if you're teaching the truth, when, when students find out the truth of what's happening and a lot of times they're finding this out on their own, teachers are not even like saying a lot of like, they're not even saying like, you know what? Here's what's really going down. Let me tell you about Fred Hampton, the FBI, you know, all this stuff. No, all the like teachers are teachers are just like say, hey, uh, here's some primary sources, um, here's some secondary sources, Correct. and they're really just facilitating it, right, Mr. Terry? Like we're we're not it's not like we're spoon feeding them information. We're just saying, here's where you can find the information. The kids are they're smart, they're figuring this stuff out on their own. And yeah. so the kids are waking up to, and that's how that term woke first came to be as a as a not as a pejorative, as a positive thing, that they're waking up, oh, yeah, these hierarchies are unjust. And yeah. uh, and so 
that this is the backlash to that. That's my theory anyway. I think kids are kids are a lot smarter than their parents think they are. Um, yeah, they are. Kids know that. I mean, they scroll through their media, social media and stuff. And you, you have a conversation with your kids. They know like so much of what they get is bull crap. They, they get it. And it just yeah. makes them. Yeah, they, they do get that. But that's why I love I love teaching AP. Um, yes. Like I teach AP world history and literally that's the job. OK, here are seven sources on this topic. And they're designed to be contrary to each other. Mm. Read them, come to your own thesis, back it up using the documents. Boom, there you go. Okay. And you cannot tell me that's, you can never, you can never argue that that is indoctrinating or pushing a narrative. It's, it's actually the exact opposite. And we can show, we can yeah. show them a PragerU video too. Like here's this yep. perspective as sure. well, where they're, they're trying to uh, counter the one of yeah. your seven sources. We're not afraid. Or... We're not afraid. We'll show them whatever you want. You can see, we're not going to try to hide information from you. Like, I, I, in, in my you, second half of uh, U.S. history, I literally assigned that Pat Buchanan speech. Like, there you go. And it's like, it's not like I, you know, come up and be like, this guy's a complete douche. <laughs> you know, he is. He right. is. Like, no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But that's not my job. It's not my, it's not my job to be like, look, I'm going to assign this, like, hateful assholes that, you know, let's, but you're going to read it anyways because, damn it, I assigned it. You know, I'm assigning it as like, hey, we're learning about the uh, the uh, culture war, and this is like the thing that defined it. Um, and I just literally assigned them the video. Like, here's the YouTube clip. Go, you know that there's no content uh, in in college at least. I can just be like, here's the thing, and maybe we'll discuss it. But like, I don't need to preface it at, at all. You know. Um, I think at the high school level, you do need to do yeah, yeah. a little bit of prefacing. Like, for example, in my A-push classes, I assign students the speech from John C. Calhoun, slavery is a positive good. Now, I don't just give them the document and say, read this, have fun. I do have to provide a little bit of context as to why John C. Calhoun is making such a speech like this on the floor of the house. Mm. Because yeah. if I just give them this speech and go like, what do you think? They're going to be like, are you, do you hate? People like it just like, <laughs> why, why, like why, why are you giving this stuff? So yeah. you have to also remember, like, w depending on the grade that you're teaching, depending on the course that you're teaching, um, you know, context and understanding is necessary. But you're right. Uh, there are there are examples of like where you can take a lost cause textbook from the 50s, 60s, 70s and, mm -hmm. and give it as a source to your students and be like, OK, take this, put it against this source right here, compare and contrast. What yeah. do you see? What works for you? What doesn't work for you? What, what does it make you think? Right at the beginning of the second half, I also assign um, the Turner thesis, a, a condensed version of it, but a, the Turner thesis. Yeah. And the other reading they have that week, the first chapter of Century of Dishonor. Wonderful. Like, no, no, those are no, no. so perfectly, you know, <laughs> it, it, and they're written within, like, what, ten, uh, uh, eight years of each other? Something like that? Century of Dishonor is like 1886. I don't know. Um, it's funny that like Century of Dishonor basically directly refutes uh, Turner before Turner. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like the uh, but like those are I treat them as primary sources, you know, because they're late 19th century um, stuff about the American West and the. Uh, the well in american expansion specifically uh and like i don't have to be like so why do you hate turner you know i don't have to do that it's like why are these opposing views what makes one different and I, actually i'm like i often use that as a way of kind of being like uh, uh, you know, here's how to build a historical argument. Turner is like literally one of the, the frontier thesis is like literally one of the best historical essays ever written. Like it's, it's hard to do better, but it's just like with birth of the nation, you know, where it's like, you know, great, you know, for all the cinematic reasons and blah, blah, blah. But it's also a clan movie, <laughs> you know, revive the clan, you know? So like there's, there's, uh, you know, connects there that are uh important but i not the one feeding it to them i let them discuss it and um, come to those conclusions and that's yeah, what think... makes you a good teacher 
I, I think hope. <laughs> I think as educators, we need to take some blame for this because I think it's and us and our and our historical teaching ancestors. It took us way too long to start teaching critical thinking skills in in social studies. Like like what we're saying, okay? I think the three of us it sounds like we've taught AP, right? Or at least yeah, you know, or yeah, and, and, and you obviously know about it, but like the idea of the the critical thinking skills mm -hmm. like that we're doing now a lot more as this uh, as this is happening. Um we took way too long to make that a key part of history because it's been and the parents you know or whatever the people that are complaining about it now you gotta remember what their experience was with a history class which was here is what happened in history and fill out the bubble sheet on the test we did not we did not even like that's okay, true I'm not that old i i didn't do a lot of that comparing right. documents and stuff no. in high school history no, no. It was yeah, a lot of 2000, lot. yeah, 2003, whatever. So, like, well, that was doesn't also, happen. And it, that took we, way too long for that push to happen. Yep. We talked about uh, how, you know, um, and I wouldn't say that it's because uh, way too many people try to say, like, uh, No Child Left Behind made people, like, teach to the test. It's, and I, my answer to that was always, well, why can't you teach from? Um, you know, why, why can't you use this as a minimum rather than a maximum? We, we can oh, teach yeah. um, tests to stop making crappy tests. I was going to say, that was the problem. The tests themselves the are the tests problem. Are, the tests yeah. are the problem. But the AP, AP tests are actually pretty solid as far as tests go. But you know yeah, what, we got away from it by because it's Common Core that started doing the like more skills based uh, teaching. And that's like late 2000s, early 2010s. That's yeah. that's actually quite sure. recent. I mean, I, I graduated high school in 06. So like that was not a thing. I had to take the proficiency. I don't know about you guys. I mean, I didn't take AP in high school. So, I mean, you know. I don't, yet think, it, I don't think AP existed back then. Did uh, it? it did. In the 90s? Yeah, it, it did. did. Oh, we had AP US, but we didn't have AP World, the class I teach. It didn't, yeah. They're just not. And it's that's changed, thankfully. It's funny, it's, though, that like, a lot it, of schools. So, in my, in, like, I, I, I'm going into my third year of teaching AP, and here's what I tell my kids I'm like, y'all are going to take an exam at the end of the year in May. I don't care. And here's the thing neither should you. Here's why I'm not going to teach you how to pass this test. I don't care what you get on this test. You get a one, you get a five. It does not matter. It's not going to affect your grade in this classroom. What I am going to teach you are the skill sets that are going to make you a much better researcher, a much better writer, a much better historian, a much better storyteller. Learning that, apply those skills to the test and you'll do fine. That's what the test is. Yep. That's the whole point. But like, I don't, I don't, because I know that there are some AP teachers that and they go into college board and they're like, okay, here's key number one. And here's item number two. And we have to do this today. I'm going to be like, I don't give a fuck. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be a good <laughs> writer. I want you to be a good storyteller. And I want you to be somebody that knows how to use their brain properly. If you can do those three things, the test is going to be a walk in the park, right? I'll teach you how to write an LEQ and a DBQ and all that other stuff. Like I'll teach you like form, right? Structure. Cause that's important. Well, yeah. But beyond that, I, I never tell them, I'm like, this whole class is designed so that you can get a five on this exam. Unfortunately, that whole style didn't become relevant till when was the curriculum change and they did that five, six years, six years ago now. I, I, I mean, you guys have seen the old yeah. AP test. It was 100 multiple choice questions, yep. content based. Yep. It took us until like five, six years ago that it became a skills based test. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate it took that long. Yeah. Um. So the uh, there has been obviously a lot of growth in, in terms of pedagogy um just like learning that we shouldn't be just lecturing and hoping that that's a you know that, that they take good enough notes kind of thing right now in the college sphere that's still very much the thing that ain't changing it hasn't changed for a thousand years um uh you're not going to change the uh the uh the way things are taught when it's that cemented yeah. um but doesn't you know, mean it shouldn't yeah 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 well <laughs> i mean there's people like me who are working to change yeah. things yeah. um i am i do use uh you know youtube i uh, 
I do encourage class discussion. Like that's there's actually a every week there's a class discussion, which at an introductory history level is that's almost tough. unheard of. Yeah. Um, and um, although the first half there's like no YouTube videos because well, the, they didn't have video cameras in the uh, 18th century. <laughs> Last time they, I checked. <laughs> but but like the second half, I I use tons of, of video clips and all that kind of stuff. I even Rickroll myself in, in class. Um, <laughs> oh, I've done that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, fu it, it's funny because they, they actually like get it. Although the first time I did that was because I started teaching in the spring of 2020. So basically, I just gave them my notes and everything. And I get an email back at one point. It's like, well, I never expected a uh, professor to rickroll me. <laughs> it's like, oh, that was meant for me. Sorry. Nice. Here's an advanced copy of the test. And then it's just a rickroll. <laughs> you know what? Wait, I got to write that down. I'm going to have to use that for this show. Hang on a second. There you go. Do it. Do it. Advanced copy of test ends up being just a goat screaming. There we go. <laughs> Goat rolled. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, I think a lot of this backlash has nothing to do with the quality of teaching because one, it's been getting better for sure. Yes. Right. It's, we've been doing, uh, we've been doing a lot better year by year, especially trying to meet the needs of students. As you're saying, Miss Cherry, uh, you know, like it's, it's changed recently but that's not what they're complaining about. They're not complaining about like new ped pedagogical styles. They're not talking about, uh, you know, the, a, you know, skills versus uh, content based curricula or anything along those lines. It, none of that, right? It's about the woke that's pervading them. They're turning our kids gay, um, and that has a perverse effect on teachers. So I think we could finally loop back to that original question, which was, you know, what's different about the, why did it do that? Why, <laughs> it just squeezed all of our image for some reason. Um, good, Might be because you have more people on the screen too. No, oh, wait, what's up? I'm sitting, oh, I'm, it's, I'm, it's I'm sitting beneath you, Matt. Well, I removed the ticker and then, okay, I don't know. Anyway. Anyways, um, you know, what is different about what's happening here? Because, you know, this is, uh, you could tell we are all very passionate about teaching. And, um, you know, we have you know, this these high hopes for what we can do in the classroom. And it has nothing to do with, like, trying to indoctrinate the children. It's like, you know, we, we want to inspire, like, historical thinkers, right? Um, so... And that's getting chilled regularly. That this all of this stuff has this chilling effect of make. Uh, there's record lows in terms of uh, teacher employment. There's uh, you know record highs in terms of of uh, parents removing children to be homeschooled. There's um, there's a uh, you know there's going to be this steady move to just teaching from the book and all that. So what's different and why is this so diff so powerful compared yeah. to all the previous attempts that we've discussed? I have an idea. So uh, the, the parents, parents right now are really the first generation of people that completely grew up with the internet. Okay and access to ideas and knowledge has become almost like per seen as democratic now where um, all points and all views are valid because you see it somewhere. So everyone feels very, I think, entitled to their opinion about things because they've had a whole life of being able to, again, access information at a level no one ever has in history. So the expand, yeah, expansion of, of information again because of the internet has again helped justify people in their opinions and thinking again they're very right that everything is of course open into into interpretation and you're going to be able to find online plenty of sources and people that are going to agree with you and you're not going to feel so i don't know 
revolutionary or whatever. So that's what I think is happening because information is, again, completely unlocked and not moderated or anything. And there's good and bad about that. But I, I think that is a big part. Everyone feels very justified and can pull things that support their cases. So they feel very um, uh, emboldened. That's what I think. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I would I would actually go further and say that most of the, the, the backlash we're seeing is from people older than myself. Um, I would say mostly Gen X and baby boomers that are the scaredest of like, Oh, the youth these days. And, uh, and I think that they are reacting to a generation specifically Gen Z and then Gen Alpha coming up as well, who not only did Gen Z grow up with the internet, they also grew up thinking critically about it because they were forced to like somebody like myself, like an elder millennial or gen, gen X, like they, uh, they, because they didn't have the internet when they were, uh, and you know, a kid, they, their value system, their belief system, their identity was already pretty much like set in stone by the time internet, they were on the internet. And so they, you're right. They found their community. They found their people. But I think with with Gen Z, a lot of them hop around a lot between identities. They, they hop around a lot between belief systems and they're just kind of like, well, oh, I never knew about that. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over here. Yeah. And uh, and be, uh, that freaks older people out. Yeah. And again, it goes back to like sure. it's a threat to the status quo. It's a threat to hierarchies currently established. And I think that's what makes this current wave a little bit different because the smartest generation is the youngest generation right now. And they, they will continue to challenge the status quo. It's only going to get, <laughs> there's nothing that you can do to stop it. So all of this stuff that they've been doing isn't going to work. I, I really don't think it is. The youngest generation mm -hmm. is also the loudest generation. <laughs> they are. I, don't, I mean, they are the, they are the ones that will without hesitation, Tell someone older to them, to their face, you are wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. You are an idiot. I don't know if that's. Uh, I, I don't know if that's particularly unique to Gen Z. It's, I, it's not. <laughs> well, I, I'll say this. No, I'll say this. I'll say this. I was a. I was a little punk too. <laughs> you know? But I'm not. Well, no, I'm not I, talking about '90s Nirvana teenage angst shit. What I'm talking I mean, about I is a copy of freaking uh, Emma Goldman on the drill sergeant's desk. So what, what, I'm saying, what, what I'm saying is this. When I say loudest generation and most brash generation, it's not that they're just getting angry to get angry. Right. They're getting angry, but they're also equipped with facts. Yeah. They're well, also coming to the table I, with, with knowledge. And I, I, will not, I, I will point out, I'm saying that, you know, the willingness to to counteract authority, that's just youth. Right. That's, it is just youth. But what um, I'm saying is but, that the, the youth of today is, 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 is definitely a much different youth that than you, than me, than Matt, than Mr. Terry. Because but they don't fall for bull crap anymore. They're not yeah, as so easily manipulated as that's we what were. I'm saying. I was that's, easily manipulated. So right. I, still am. I I will uh, I was kind of getting at something there. It because you know it's not about like that they're more rebellious now. It's not that they're like more experimental or anything along those lines. It's not that there's something particularly different about like some inherent characteristic of the generation as uh as Mr. Terry was pointing out, um, it w uh, it's it's that they're better informed. That's that's and that's that's the point that I'm trying to get at is the fact that it's a loud generation, but they're coming at you with knowledge because they study, they look at not necessarily study, but they look, they are aware of the world around them. They are aware of name me another generation that could literally convince a presidential rally that he had sold out a stadium only to fill it maybe not even a quarter full because they figured out how to game the system, buy all the tickets, get all the tickets, and then leave him with only about maybe two, 3,000 people in the stadium that could see 20,000. That's knowledge that you have wasn't to that, have. Wasn't that actually here in Albuquerque? Was it? <laughs> I think it was. Okay. Well, hey, you got- Was that you, Cypher? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I that's but but you're that, right. But and that I, was in uh, 2016, I think. Uh, yeah, but but so I wasn't what, here yet. What I'm saying is like that's that's the point that you got at is what I was trying to 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 ultimately get at is that this is a louder generation that has no problem being brash, that has no problem standing up. The only difference between us and them when we were kids versus these kids now is that they're coming equipped with 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 receipts. <laughs> it's it's not like it's not just like oh you don't understand me and then you just storm off to your room and then listen to an Alice in Chains record. It's a very easy way of phrasing it. <laughs> yeah, it's no, it's here, you here, don't understand. <laughs> right, it's like no, you don't understand me, and here's why. Bam, 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 bam. Like bullet lists. Like even my twelve year old, even my twelve year old is like, like, holy crap! They're coming you're out a with better Excel. person than I am. How is it possible, <laughs> dude? They've got Excel spreadsheets ready to go. With all the data that they want to show you, which and yet, are... and yet they don't have the power. Like no, we have one member of Congress so far that's Gen Z, and it fit half of Congress what? is still baby boomer. Who's Maxwell, Gen Z? Maxwell Frost. He's from technically, Florida. although I would argue he's a younger millennial, oh, but geez. still, yeah. Like half of Congress is a is baby boomers right now. Yes. It's insane. Like yes. they're holding on to the power. We have a silent Gen president. Um, oh, yeah, silent, hey, silent gens more base than baby boomers. Just saying. Shout out, to, shout out to all the silent gens out there. You know who you are. I see you. They're not in here. Right <laughs> they'd have We've to be. They'd have generation. to understand how to use the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> But, 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 I, but I'm, I'm being ageist. No, I'm I <laughs> but here's, I mean, the best part about like us being teachers now is the fact that because we have students now that are so plugged in literally and figuratively yeah. um, is the fact that they are much more aware of the world around them and they are willing to have that discussion with you in the classroom versus just sitting there and literally just being spoon fed, whatever it is you put into their, yeah. into their head. And so uh, this is a perfect segue to the final uh, topic, but I, I want to first say that like uh, something that we're kind of hinting around because, you know, one of the big things is like, oh, trans people, they're, they're indoctrinating our kids into trans folk. There's a really famous way of kind of debunking because the fact is there are more trans people, right? At least out, right? Um, there are tremendously more. Um, but one thing that uh, I, I've seen a lot on social media that's a perfect way of, of debunking the whole thing of like, oh, it's being indoctrinated is, is called the left hand chart. Um, yep. So let me, great one. let me uh, look up. Don't make me tap the sign. <laughs> I love, I love yeah. when people do that. <laughs> so I, I want to bring this up so that we can basically yeah. be like, okay, so the, this moral panic is absolute bunk. Um, and here's how. Do, 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 boop. The left hand chart. So, <laughs> people in the uh, in the early 20th century were at an all time low in no, terms. There was of something in the water in 1908. Uh, you didn't they're know that. Turkin, they're <laughs> turning the freaking frogs left handed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it started to level out in the in 1960s, right? So what was going on here? It was that awareness was being raised that we have all this like anti left handed stuff. The word sinister literally just used this, to this mean hits home to me. Left I'm left handed, by the way. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the funny thing is, uh, it, like in the military, you have, uh, uh, you know, vast majority of people right handed, but you'd be surprised how many people are left eyed. Um, because most people don't know that they are what dominant eye they have. Left hand, easy, right eye. That's why I'm a terrible shot. Is easy. <laughs> oh, yeah. well then, yeah, you should be shooting right hand. I can't, I can't um, do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I <laughs> knew people, I, or I have a close friend who's, uh, you know, right handed, but left eyed. Um, and he just like refuses to shoot left handed. And it's like, dude, you could probably be beating me. And like, mm. I'm shaky and I have to wear glasses and stuff. <laughs> and somehow I'm always better than you. Come on. <laughs> and like, you know, obviously I also know how to apply the fun fundamentals and everything. But like, uh, you know, the, the fact is everybody, you uh, if you're in the military and you're left eyed, that meant that you had to, uh, you know, shoot. Left-handed. I feel weird even 
you know, holding it like that, but like, you know, you, you carry left-handed because that's your dominant. Um, but like, um, so even there, there's like this kind of steady rise of realization that people are, are differently eyed and it's actually kind of evenly split. Um, but the, uh, but left-handedness is currently sitting at just below 12%, right? And it's leveled out. Same thing is going to happen with trans people. I probably know we're close to 12%, but, you know, we've seen it go past 1% recently, right? And so maybe it'll get up to like 2 or 3%. More about like doubling the percentage. Yeah. Yeah. It might get up to as much as 3%. Oh my gosh. Um, and the point is, is that as you, as you normalize something, it becomes, it tends to get to an actual like naturalized level. Um, and the same thing's happening here. And that's what a lot of this is fighting against. It's the fact that like kids are more informed and now they're being exposed to all these kinds of things and suddenly they're trans. Um, but in reality, it's just going to level out eventually once um, it becomes normalized enough. Um, and especially in terms of normalization, in terms of kind of fighting against all of this uh, anti-education stuff, the final question is, what can we do about it? Um, By the way, there, there was a couple of questions about the left-handed thing. I think that people understand about uh, why it went up. It wasn't that people didn't think they were left-handed. It was up until that time. You, even though if you were born that way, can you, you were... Can you out the person who said that so I can highlight uh, it? Jerry, I think, was saying something... Um, but it was that people were being trained to be right-handed, even if they were left-handed, you know what I mean? Like, you know, smack their hand, right? You ever right. saw that in like old movies, some, right. oh, this person's doing something with the left hand, smack it. No, you do it with your right hand, right? You do the right hand. And then once yeah, I'm not gonna for, I, I'm guessing at that, yeah. Or oh, at that time, people say, Jerry's saying, no, calling it like disingenuous like to say dis that like trans yeah. people are, or that trans <laughs> people exist. That, but that's, it's a, it's a, that's it's just a, bigotry. Yeah. It's something um, that you're disposed with. So then and that changed in like the 1920s and started saying, oh, it's like a thing and it's fine. And then people started to be more open about that. So it wasn't nothing like thinking that way. It's I think that to, to answer, I think that to answer your question in terms of like, what can we do about it? Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned the answer already. And I think we've touched on it a couple of times. It's this idea of normalization. If you do not make such a big deal out of something, you mention it, you discuss it, and then you allow people to ruminate over it and to think about it on their own and just leave it at that. People will eventually get over it. Mm -hmm. it's, if, if it's something that is never seen as, I'll give you an example. There's legislation that was uh, on the House floor that was passed, uh, I believe, to make it so that um, trans women could not play sports with um, uh, 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 cis women. They said, no, can't do it. It's it's dangerous. We got to protect the, 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 cisgendered, uh, the cisgendered girls that are playing these sports. You never hear any legislation no. about a trans man wanting to play with cisgendered guys. Why is that? Except because for uh, there was actually a recent Texas case in which a trans man was forced to play with, tr with cis women. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. But the bigger, uh, but yeah. what I'm saying is the bigger argument though has been to protect yeah. cisgender uh, women from trans women playing sports. It's with become them. kind of a, a um, like uh, transphobes love to make it seem like it's a trans woman being forced to play with with men uh, yeah. with uh, with cis women. Yes, but it's actually a trans man forced to play with cis men women so that yeah exactly so like what it is is like th there's this there's been this long-held idea of you know pr pr you know protecting the, the 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 fragile uh woman in the united states protecting femininity here's, here's that picture by the way okay that this one right here that's a that's a trans man being okay. forced to wrestle with wrestle women with cis women yeah okay but what i'm saying is that like there's been a long-held belief among many people in the United States for as far back as we've been, uh, 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 prior to even being a country about protecting femininity, about protecting, 
uh, what was seen as the, 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 the fairer sex, the weaker sex, right? Oh, heaven forbid. And that's something that carries into today when it comes to this trans argument, this idea of like, you can't have a, 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 a trans woman play with cis women because that's a man. What if I'll like... Also, I'll also point out that that's wrestling. And in most states, uh, there is no segregation of gender in in wrestling. Yeah, you can have yeah. men and women wrestle each other, I, no problem. I, I just started, I, just started combi- I, uh, or separating just barely, like mm, three years ago. Just started segregating. Yeah, like, so now there's was, there's there's was, boys wrestling and girls wrestling now. It wasn't it segregated, be, and now it is. What? Now it is. Yeah, it used to be. Yeah, you, you the boys. That's the would, opposite would of where it's supposed to go. But yeah, now it's, <laughs> it's separate because they you know there's reason. I think yeah, they'll be. Well, they'll be I understand why there's reasons. Yeah, uh, in, be yeah I mean, honestly, the one thing that was really because I was I wrestled in high school, and the one thing that was really annoying about uh, wrestling women is that they would just go right for it. <laughs> and that's, i have that's a reason there is no yeah. recourse for that the women have an unfair advantage <laughs> but anyway but what i'm saying is that like it, it's it's this misogynistic belief that like women are to be protected at all times women are meant are, are to be sheltered are to be preserved ultimately right but they're also meant to be someone who stands by your side as a support system they're not meant to like be front and center, right? The, 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 the spheres in which women are supposed to exist are, are meant to be more the private sphere versus men, which are meant to be more in the public sphere. But it's fascinating to me that with this trans argument that yes, let's protect cisgender women from the trans woman. Cause heaven forbid, it's just a guy that wants to say he's a trans woman just so he can like go, you know, rock out with like with girls on the field. But then the opposite argument of like having a trans man play with cisgender men isn't talked about anywhere near as much. So mm-hmm. the argument basically is like you could have a trans man go play football and be a D lineman if you want to. No one's going to question that. Well, like, I, I there's, showed you there's, an, exact, uh, an exact case, a rather famous case of, uh, of exactly a trans man not being allowed to play with cis men. I mean, I'm sure there are specific yeah, cases, but, but I'm saying that the, the larger arg- yeah, but the larger <laughs> argument is that cisgender women are the ones that have to be protected from trans women because it's a danger to them, right? They mask it under the idea of, oh, well, it's unfair because a trans woman, biologically male, they're all, they're, they're just naturally going to be stronger, naturally going to be faster, yada, yada, yada. But then like when if, if a trans man wants to go play football with these biologically stronger, faster beings. I, I, let's let's get off of this because I've already shown you that there are very clear instances of the of exactly the thing that you're saying that doesn't happen does happen. No, I'm not saying it, um, I'm not but saying it like, doesn't, but but the bigger point here is yeah. not you know look at the the you know no. whether or not they like trans men or women it's it's actually has nothing to do with that right right that's it, that's his bigger point yeah that yeah, yeah. The, the, the bigger point is ultimately like just normalization like we've been talking about is the thing that leads to lessening these moral panics that we're facing on a regular basis by, so by what norm- do we do about that well i mean i think that by normalizing it the first thing you have to do is you first off expose these topics to students expose these topics to the public but instead of trying to rile them up you ask them to think about these topics. Let's engage in conversation. Let's engage in discussion. What makes you hate this thing? What makes you fear this thing? Why do you think that this is an issue? Allow people to actually have- Why do you think girls are icky? <laughs> <laughs> but allow people to have a forum like we're having here, right? We could have differences of opinion on numerous things, which I know we do. We all come from different schools of thought. We all come from different specialties in our, in, in our fields. So we're gonna talk about things differently. But at no point am I going to go and say, you know, fuck you, Joe, for 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 thinking this thing because you're an <laughs> asshole because you think of X, Y. I want to hear your position because maybe the way I'm thinking about something is incorrect. Or maybe I just haven't thought of a specific perspective until you showed it to me or vice versa. So by just offering people the opportunity to speak their minds, but to also provide counterpoint in a much more rational, logical and calm manner instead of fear mongering like they do on mostly on right wing media it gets to the point where ultimately it just becomes a topic of conversation that like okay you like this thing i like this thing we're probably not going to ever really agree on it but i think we can safely say that this is not going to be like the world ender that some so, people think it is so a lot of what you're talking about here is what 
teachers can do. Um, and that's supposing, or that's presupposing that teachers actually have the the leeway to to make such an open and welcoming space. I mean, the, you can Florida never have is that like literally in a class. Oh, sorry, say that again. Oh, so you could, like the conversation um, you're saying there, like the open discussion that I would, I'd be fired if I yeah. had something like that. Well, why would you be fired for having an open discussion? Why would you be fired for on that? Method? No, on that topic, on trans people. Yeah. Oh, oh, just bring okay, just okay. bringing it up. Yeah, yeah. Just really? saying that that this this exists. This that, is Utah. That this transgenderism exists. I mean, okay, maybe in a very specialized set, maybe you could get away with that, and like a, a maybe like a like a psychology class, and even then, ooh, man, I, my psychology teacher next door, anytime they open that up, they just have to pivot. Turn bad. I here's here's something I, I think could be helpful is starting these these discussions with things that aren't as emotionally charged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. But, and you build up like that's that's really like doing good. like a trans debate that's like the final boss yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean you got yeah. you can hit yeah hit and those. fight okay. total combat yeah. <laughs> that's mr x teachers we can we can i think can really can really scale those kind of things with sure <laughs> You, yeah. you start yeah. off uh, fighting the racist, then you start off, <laughs> then you fight the homophobe, then yeah. you get to the transphobe. Exactly. Okay, so like, <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a really good way to, because like, I, I think all of us would agree that one of our, our goals is to to spread empathy, to teach empathy, like, because sure. it does have to be taught. I, I can't stress that enough. And the b even bigger goal of spreading empathy is survival of our species. We, we like... We have to constantly think about that. Like we're every human being, we want to have the same rights. We we so at least we most of us say we want equality. Um, and so what that means ultimately is that it doesn't matter who you are, what your beliefs are, what your identity is, what your religion background, whatever. Um, you are a human being. You have human rights. And so mm -hmm. the focus on human rights, um, I think, I think is the most important thing a teacher can do because. Yeah, it doesn't even matter what uh everyone gets behind that. Yeah. Yeah, everybody does. Yeah. We all on board all of a sudden. And then the more um we can expose students, like, okay, maybe transgenderism is off the table. Fine. But that doesn't mean a bunch of other stuff can't be on the table. And and again, you're you're it's just informational. It's just like this is this exists. I'm not telling you how to believe. I'm not telling you like I'm just we're just we're all together historians detectives trying to figure things out and i mean we learn lessons from history there's too much history to teach uh even like curriculums are loose enough where you you really a lot of teachers do have leeway they can choose what they if, if i want to focus two weeks on the civil war instead of two days like another teacher does i can sometimes like and so like i think teachers do have still a lot of power as far as what they can focus on and they shouldn't be afraid for now. It depends yeah. on the, and there's a reason why I phrase well, this question. Uh, there's a reason why I phrase this question not just about teachers, but creators and students. Um, well, I, teachers should not be afraid, though. Like, screw they that. They shouldn't be. Like, but I know, I, I know that you might lose your job, but like, we need courage in these times. Like, we need a John Scopes who's going to challenge. The teeth, like, remember John Scopes was the yeah. guy of the Scopes, you know, that monkey Scopes trial. was, uh, right, right, right. was a substitute cool. teacher. I know he was a plant. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but we're, we need teachers who are willing to like do what's right. And so like, I mean, I know I say that as, as somebody on the outside now, and I did not share my full opinion on contemporary issues on Twitter, uh, and, until yeah. I left the profession. So I, I, it's easy for me to say that, but at the same time, I'm just like, man, like it seems like it's getting worse and worse. And if enough teachers do just stand up and do the right thing, which is just basically saying, hey, critical thinking is cool, then I think that these laws are not going to get enforced. And, and, and actually, a lot of these state legislators who wrote these laws, don't if care. you actually read the, the, the bills, like, yeah, they, I think they, just they would don't care. <laughs> well, but I think they would have a hard time in court because uh, if you if, if you compare the Constitution to what they have proposed in this laws these laws I think oh it's uh, huge the, First Amendment value. I, exactly yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. the defendants first, I think the teacher the First, first Amendment, Amendment is on the side of the teachers mm -hmm. that's so you yeah know. and well, and like there's 
like I I agree that teachers uh, we should have some teachers who are willing to sacrifice their jobs but once again that's that's their job you know that's their life yeah we can't yeah. we can't uh, you know always expect yeah, them to be, be you know they're they're not like mr terry yeah. you're gonna be the martyr john scope yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, be challenging can't this year. expect everyone to be martyrs you know um, can't expect everyone to be martyrs but for this job especially today in some parts of the united states you have to go in sort of with that mentality because here's I, like do you want to be robotic I, or not we're, we're focusing so much on teachers because yes i know we're all teachers here but like we're also all creators we have but, something beyond the classroom we have a tool we're using it right now that, I, think, I, that I think we don't need martyrs no you don't need well but here's the thing matt cypher you guys are it, it took you a long time to get to this point and you guys have busted your ass to get to, to get to the points that you that you're at but you now have built and established yourselves large enough audiences uh, to where you can command a larger space in the, if you want to call it the history tube space, so to speak, where you can have these conversations and talk about these bigger topics as a whole and really not have to worry about as much. I do. Well, I'm still looking for a job. <laughs> you're still looking for a job. But what I'm saying is if, if you decided I might have lost a job because of that. But if you decided tomorrow, though, because of your subscribe, which fucking sucks, by the way, that does suck. But if you decided tomorrow I I that, that you wanted to go YouTuber full time, Florida, uh, applying to Florida. Yeah. But if University of Florida. I'm not going to say. Sorry, that. I don't mean to derail this. Uh, that <laughs> no, 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 really, whatever. I'm, I'm tell, not going to say it. Later. I'm not going like to say which one. I've but yeah, it, it yeah, was anyway. a state school in Florida. But what I'm saying is, you if you decided tomorrow, got to the interview sorry, stage. That was my cat. Uh, if you decided tomorrow to go full time YouTuber, um, I like it, it wouldn't be the end of the. It wouldn't necessarily I, be the end of the road. I didn't for really it. have a choice in the matter. I well, just am now. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, but what I'm saying is like that's not necessarily going to be like the end of the road for you. You know what I mean? For Matt, okay. it's the For Matt, it's the same thing. Not going to be the end of the road for you. For smaller creators, though that don't have as large a subscriber base that don't make as much money that, or that, or that can't make as much money through the platform. They are not going to have the ability to, uh, make the type of messaging and make the type of, of, of content that you're going to, that you're going to make and have it large enough to, and, and have it have as much of an impact. Hmm. You know what I mean? So I, where am I going with this? Ultimately, I think like, it, as a creator, you have to, I think, sort of go into it with a sort of pseudo martyr mentality because you're a creator, because you have autonomy, because the only person that can dictate what you put on your YouTube channel is you, you then have to decide, okay, what kind of stuff do I want to put out for an audience to consume? Do I want to keep it safe? so that somebody might find my material and potentially give me opportunities outside of the YouTube sphere? Or do I actually want to go like balls to the wall and do the deep dives like, and, 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 and expose a lot of history that isn't talked about as much in the classroom so that I can e expose people to this type of history. It's a balance. It is. I mean, it is a balance. That's what I do. Like I, I, I talk, I talk about to knowing better about this um, because knowing better who was in the chat earlier, mm -hmm. he, he, he does like go all in and on these topics that are more controversial and kind of show that a darker side of history. And like uh, mm -hmm. I choose a lot of times to choose the safe bet. And it's like, well, because now I have bills to pay family to feed, whatever. And so you, but at the same time, what feeds our souls? Yeah, like I'm going to make a video, and, and I know Cypher's already done this, but I want to make a video about systemic racism as well. And I, and also we need more voices other than white dudes. Obviously, we've talked about this before as well. I sure. mean, there is a growing uh, yeah. amount of uh, so a lot of uh, <laughs> similar complexion here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, am, and, am I the darkest one here? <laughs> <laughs> you can't uh, tell, but I'm actually pretty tanned right now. Oh, right on. It's but just, like there's like, a white screen in front brand. of me. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, like difference oh, in white. Oh here. yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, there's a growing number of, of female, uh, especially history tubers, and if you come across one, one support them. Um, a lot of them have obstacles that we don't have to worry about. 
um, people of color, obviously, like uh, are a lot of a lot of I notice a lot of um, people of color who are social commentators end up delving a lot, crossing over into our territory as well. They yeah. go into a lot of historical that stuff. That can be a huge problem, though. It can be, but uh, and, at the same and, time, we need to collaborate with these folks. Yeah. Uh, the bridge. I don't yeah. know. I, I prefer to keep it within educational spaces than uh, trying to reach out to, like, I don't know. I, I, I tend to cross over a lot with, like, lefty tubers. And, like, I, I'm not really interested in, in uh, you know, doing collaborations with, with uh, you know, a specifically political outlook. You know, that's not that's not what I'm interested in doing. Well, well apparently but Mr. I was B, so looking Mr. forward to your, to your collaboration with Charlie Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I swore up and down i'm like cypher and charlie kirk what other <laughs> video would i want to watch i mean we might collaborate in the ring <laughs> <laughs> michael, punch, michael punch for punch with that douchebag <laughs> <laughs> you know he might co uh, collaborate with my fist yeah you know. but what, but, no, but, like, but i think i think i think matt's right uh and, and Mr. Terry, forgive me. I, I personally have unfortunately been way away from YouTube far too long. And uh, I hate that I've done that. But um, in turn, like, you got you history mind? channel though. <laughs> Dude, but you know what though? Like, I mean, it's great that I get to do that. But the only reason I got to do that was because of this. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like for Mr. Terry, like, Mr. like uh, for your channel, forgive me, man. I'm sorry. And I'm going to check out your channel. But like, how many, how many subscribers do you have, guy? Uh, 365,000. Fuck me. Well done, dude. All right. Watch <laughs> okay. your language. Boy. Hey, man. All right. We've said we've said worse. Okay. Give you but detention. Like, but what I'm saying is, <laughs> see, <laughs> happily, you want me to spend Number an hour in the library after school? I'm down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> happily. Oh, and that reminds me. I will uh, put your. Uh, I will put your um, your channel links in the oh, description below. I the, yours isn't there because you didn't like. Uh, say yes prior but uh they will go down once i can add it mr terry it afterwards. it's easy yeah but um but, but the fact that you have that many subscribers and i know we want to wrap this up pretty soon but i just want to get a little information from them because you have this i know you have this many subs uh, because you have that many subscribers um do you feel uh, a sort of uh, a larger sense of responsibility in terms of what it is that you present on your channel versus what it is that you do in the classroom. Cause on your channel, 365,000 subscribers, that means you're going to have that many more people yeah. watching just because of the amount of feeds that you're in right. to, to begin with. And I imagine that yeah. people might use you in classrooms as well. So do you feel like a larger sense of responsibility on YouTube or mm -hmm. do you feel a larger sense of responsibility in your physical classroom? That's interesting. Um, in the class, yeah, for sure. Um, I I try to take, I, I would say on YouTube, I, I may do bring up things a little bit more than I would on like in the classroom, but I've, I've made it like a goal. And actually like some people, I do a lot of commentary. That's, that's what I do a lot of um, is I intentionally try to like bring a, an unbiased approach. Like that's something I do. I'm apolitical for the most part on my channel. Mm -hmm. And for that same reason that I, for the most part act on YouTube, like I would in the, uh, in the classroom. And luckily, and it's something I've liked is a lot of people have said they appreciate that. I'll go into, I don't start into a prayer you video and do a, a like a, a reaction commentary feedback thing saying anything like, it's just, okay, here's what it is. I'm not going to evaluate. I'm going to say, here's what they're saying. Oh, here's some other context. Do another thing. I try to be the uh, the other voice. But yeah, I, I limit myself a lot. But um, and a lot and, and a lot of that is because uh, I'm still in the classroom. Um, I really don't want to say anything. I, I don't I don't talk about like who I vote for. I don't talk about political parties. I don't do any of that on my channel. I really mm -hmm. don't. I'll cover them. But I don't express any personal things because that's literally what they tell us to. And let's say, let's say, for example, I don't, I don't make enough to completely uh, or to quit teaching. Uh, but like, let's say I was, I was able to quit teaching. I don't know if I would change as much. I, I think I would still try to take the role of what a teacher should do and, and be is present things. And then, you know, I'm not going to make the decision for, I'm not gonna make the conclusion for you. You're going to evaluate it. So mm. yeah. Well, I, I that's mean, like, I'm it, even I, I absolutely refuse to to you know say what my politics are, 
you know, my, my politics is right there in the channel name, cynicism. Um, <laughs> it's actually really good for, for history and for, especially political history. And yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, like I, I like to define cynicism, uh, at least political cynicism as being the uh, perpetua uh, perpetually disappointed optimist. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, I like the, but like, you know, that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And, you know, one could say I am a cipher to people's understanding of my politics. Um, it's in the game. <laughs> <laughs> but do, you, like, do you, by the way, do you sell like a bigots get banned t-shirt or bumper? Yes, I do. <laughs> I love you. I, I, I love literally you so much. Do. Uh, Wonderful. I, love I do you. like That's reading great. your, like your, your, the comments that come into your. Oh, there it is. Let's go. The poster I actually. Heck yeah. Yeah, that you can buy that at the thing. That's you know, that's Diogenes with a band hammer about to slap Woodrow Wilson down with it. <laughs> 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 I commissioned that from an uh, artist named uh, Birdie Blake. They're uh, great artists for that stuff. Nice. Um, and anyway, so uh, the the um, uh, getting back onto like this this kind of we don't really have to be apolitical i wouldn't because i i would argue that like there's no such thing as being yeah. truly apolitical sure. you're trying to come off that way though like yeah you're trying uh, I mean. you're i have biases i have yeah. political things but i always figure that like it, when it comes to the history that i'm presenting it's like i'm presenting history right i'm not i'm not here to like try to convince you or anything you're going to take it or leave it like that's up to you um this is history mm -hmm. um you know i am present I'll, I'll present the arguments you know but i'm presenting right like it's it's a one-way street <laughs> um they're like i am responsive to comments in that but like comments come after i've made the thing right <laughs> they don't come while i'm making it yeah um, so, you know, I know that's not exactly a philosophy a lot of you guys believe in, but that's, that's generally how I approach YouTube. And, um, that's kind of how I've always approached it. It's public history for me, at least it's, it's not popular history. I'm not concerned about popular history. I'm concerned about public history. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we can make a huge difference in, uh, by, um, instead of, um, you know, being concerned about convincing people all the time, it's now more like, hey, here's a resource that, like, if you want to go and learn about history when your school district is literally not allowing you to do so, here you go. Right. Um, I know, that, like, I know that there's a couple of school districts that have specifically reached out to me and asked, like, how, uh, it's always weird when they ask permission to use your stuff in the classroom and it's like yeah like yes please it's, it's, yeah it's, it's very nice when, for. <laughs> it's very nice when they do that though yeah yeah, but, yeah uh, it's great it, it's it's it just always kind of like you don't need permission man yeah right. <laughs> do it i mean <laughs> we do we, we do this because we love it and we're not just trying to like sell a narrative to uh like whenever you see a prager you video that says here's the real history of blah 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 like they have an agenda that right. uh, is clearly partisan, and I, we that's the I thing too. Like Umbridge, when they put like some sort of adjective in terms of uh, like a qualitative adjective before history, <laughs> you yeah. know, like the true history, the secret history, the right. You well, know, secret, not the, you. Secret, yeah, that secret, kind of stuff. If you put the word "secret" in the title, though, you're going to get clicks. Well, I got to say that th that is it's <laughs> clickbait. Yeah, uh, you, but you I wanted to add. Uh, I kind of I used to have the position of Mr. Terry, where I was like, uh, I'm not going to let the viewer know my political beliefs right. and my my students. That was always the case. Um, finally, JJ McCullough changed my mind more than anyone, um, and I just was like, you know what? They need to know where I'm coming from because yep. I choose. Like there's no objective version of history that just doesn't exist. That that's right. a fallacy. And so like I, they have to know where, why I have, like why I decided to leave this in and to focus more on this part and you know like leave that part out. Um, and so I just did li a live stream one night where I just took all these political tests. And but the distinction is, and I think I told you this in person, Mr. Terry, when I when we met up. Yeah. 
Uh, I do not endorse candidates, specific candidates. I don't endorse political parties at all. I'm a, I'm an idea guy. Like I, let's talk ideas. Like, and so every, all my viewers on my channel know the, one of the, the most things, the biggest thing I am passionate about in terms of ideas is uh, voting reforms. And so I do spend a lot of time, like I'm, I say, Hey, here's my opinion on voting reforms, making sure they know this is my opinion. You recently went against your old opinion. I know. On, and on I changed my mind. Choice. Yeah. Ranked choice voting. I used to think it was a lot better than it is now. Like now I'm like having second thoughts about it. So it's Hey, like, I just had on last Sunday, uh, did, a, did a collab with vlogging through history. We were talking you know, about electoral college. I'd like to propose, I want you two to debate. I'll moderate. Oh, that, <laughs> okay. He, let's do it. Would you do it? He, yeah. He's, he's for, he's, he's still for, um, the electoral college and, and stuff. So, yeah, that would be we'll a lot. I said, hey, let's get it. I'll talk to Mr. Pete. Let's, let's get a you can get a debate going. I'll, I'll moderate it. We have witnesses now. To say. <laughs> okay. This has to happen now. Hey, awesome. hey, I see nothing. I hear nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. I said nothing. I don't even know who you people are. <laughs> <laughs> but like the um, so uh, this is actually an interesting question from uh, Jacko because it, it fits exactly what we're talking about is, um, you know, this recent push to kind of like basically force teachers to teach from the book and, and um, you know, and chilling any kind of uh, attempts at diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, is this doomed to fail? Uh, and like, you know, relating it to the, uh, you guys might remember, um, there was th that big push back in the, uh, in, um, the like late 90s 20 uh, early 2000s a lot of that like creationism trying to teach the controversy and all that kind of stuff and uh, that's actually still on the books in a lot of places um but like for the most part like, intelligent design that's what they read that's uh, what they call it intelligent that's design. that's what they yeah. rephrased it as <laughs> they lost the creationism it's more more palatable push yeah. but it's the same yeah, thing. yeah. well it's yeah but the yeah. The thing is, the whole idea that because uh, intelligent design still allows for evolution, you know, all you have to say is, well, the process of evolution was intelligently designed. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Solved. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but like, but uh, mm -hmm. the the push to to basically teach the controversy rather than like actually just teaching science um it has basically gone away right like they lost creationists lost um so will we see the same here probably yes yeah yes, and i would argue that it's because what we do here that like students have access to um to youtube right like you can't you can't take that away <laughs> well but also the the people that like okay i just made a video about this so i'm sorry and but i you historic like, nook i i made a video about essentially it's media literacy but it's like how do you know something is true or not and mm -hmm. just a my a shortcut to my thing by the good way. video by the way and not as good as i would wouldn't want but uh, th right. but thank you mr Cherry. Um, it, it got the point across though <laughs> no matter what uh, i had too many dad jokes anyway um that was <laughs> a problem. every video <laughs> i got i got so many complaints like mr b you're trying to be funny just get to the point shut up anyway <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like uh my thesis of that video essentially is um we over time we start to finally pay attention to the people who can predict the future and scientists more than anyone can predict the future. And so when you have that ability and then you have also on the flip side, you have the, like the doomsdayers, like Jesus is coming any day now and the world's going to end and then the world doesn't end. And they're like, mm -hmm. maybe we should listen to the guy who predicted that this eclipse would happen, you know? So like that, I think over time, that's when, like they keep saying that's going to happen and it doesn't happen. But these people who, who said climate shit, like the world is, is going to warm this, this much. It did happen. Holy crap. Maybe, maybe they were right. That's mm -hmm. what's going to happen. It takes time, but eventually people are like the people who predicted in the past, got it right. Maybe well, they I, were right. I will say that, that, that doesn't really work for history. Um, uh, yeah. Well, cause, cause you know, the, uh, 
the fact is <laughs> like there, there's a meme on my uh, on my discord server that uh like cypher is not allowed to make predictions <laughs> <laughs> like about russia like none of us saw that coming like russia invading actually, Ukraine, they wouldn't they wouldn't be so actually uh people on my server can attest i was like uh, you know the week before i was going uh, everybody's saying like this ain't gonna happen it's like no he's actually kind of obligated to um like this is like nah. this isn't like it's although i shouldn't say that i was the one making that prediction though you know in live in the drunk chat that week we were uh, i was the one saying it but i'd gotten it that's from everything comes out from a chat. that's right i'd gotten it from <laughs> well no historians <laughs> but, historians can predict trends we can't predict specific events that's a, a big distinction we element. need to make I mean, if you, like, we if, we know no no, no, no the no. foundation we strong, know <laughs> we know that in the future what's going to happen uh here in the next few years Donald Trump will die. I and it's gonna happen. Uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I can't tell you, I can't tell you specifically what's gonna happen, but we all know as historians, will too. we all know because we know history, <laughs> what's gonna happen after he dies. There's going to be millions of Americans who say that he didn't actually die of this cause, he was really killed by the deep state. Mm. Yeah, we, we can see not it actually happening. dead, you see, or he's, he's not actually, actually dead. Yeah, right. Yeah, we can predict these bigger, broader trends because they, they do rhyme. They, they you know, he, yeah, it, we just can't get the specifics right. Like, right. we don't, <laughs> you're, you're just being as a Gasmov right now. <laughs> uh, um, who that is okay. Oh, you haven't read the Foundation trilogy? No, it's a, it's a sci fi author, bro. I gotta check it out. Okay, I'll check it out. I'm not a big sci fi person, I'll write it down. The main character or, or characters are historians. Oh, <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> They're called psycho historians, and they make uh, predictions, and they have to like make a foundation to save the uh, universe from this like impen impending dark age as the empire is about to fall, and um, because they they predict that the empire is about to fall, and freaking you know they find a, they make a foundation and. I don't know if I should say anything because there's a TV show right now that's actually about to get into this plot. That's the second book, but it's a there's a second foundation. Um, I mean, there's no reason no, there's no reason for me to read it anymore. You literally spoiled the whole first book for me. <laughs> Way to go! No, Thank well, you. I just explained like uh, something that happens over the course of like 1,500 years. So there's a there's a little bit more to it. Prove that you're a good historian. <laughs> the fact that you can take 1,500 years and condense it to 30 seconds, like well done. <laughs> Well done on your part. That's a, that's um, Asmos. <laughs> there, there you go. Uh, but the way, yeah, uh, the just because I'm gonna forget if, if I don't say it. We were going back to the like um, historian. Why why reports. will this? Why will these pushes fail? Right? Isn't that kind of what we were talking yes, about? Yes. Yes. I, I think the big thing is, and I think you could probably say it for all those other things we were talking about about why didn't the creationism thing work or the, you know that kind of stuff is like. The, the the kids we're talking about they're exposed to this stuff they don't have a problem with it they really don't like um right like i i have i i can even in a like a conservative place you know where i have i pr probably have you know a, a gay or transgender student probably in every class probably every class right and um when you talk to other kids if other kids talk about it they don't care right they really like some do yep. they do it I don't care that much. It's not a, like it's not like a big deal because they have yeah, to be taught. They're probably under they have to the be taught to care. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they really that. don't. They they kind of go along with their thing. So if it doesn't come from that, because it's 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 the people, you know, the parents and stuff that are the ones. But like, they don't care. The, <laughs> the kids aren't out. You're not seeing kids out protesting and picketing and going to the the school board meetings that's not right. not what it is so and if they're not going to care you're seeing kids doing yeah. exactly the opposite you're doing yes, exactly the opposite yeah we're having walkouts all we i see walkouts all the time in yeah. my state about about things like that so if they don't care or if they feel the opposite way how is it ever going to be long-term successful to have these changes and, made? and you like up to the third part of the question right there and students. oh yes okay. um because i think i think that's actually like the the main thing the main takeaway is that like this is not like all this anti-education stuff isn't really about like you know changing students minds or really even like you know stopping the transgender ideology it's it's about scoring political points right and you know it's going to it's going to harm tra uh, transgender people for sure um you're going to see a little bit of attempts to 
to um, to uh, to uh, bring back old stuff like the Lost Cause and that. We're seeing that too. But the main thing is, it's just like as soon as DeSantis uh, either wins or loses the the Republican nomination, it's just going to go away, right? Um, <laughs> like if if we have a Republican president um, in 2025, all of this is gone. Yeah, in a heartbeat. And you can yeah. predict that as a historian. <laughs> because you've looked at previous trends and you understand how it might potentially go moving forward. <laughs> like, we'll see reverberations of it and we'll see continual, I mean, fights over curriculum will never go away. It's been the part of the thing all along. We've talked about this. Yeah. But like this particular state level chilling of of teachers ability to teach in the classroom like we have the ability as YouTubers to continue to teach the way we want to teach um, and create a resource that uh, that is outside of the classroom that students will just go around whatever is being force fed them and they'll make their own thing. And I was repeatedly reminded with all of this uh, of a I don't remember if it's 21 Jump Street or 22 Jump Street, but one of them has like this whole joke about like they're going back to high school and they're supposed to fit in 21 uh what 21 jump street 21 yeah. jump street go, they go back to high school. both of them that uh, i think it might be the sequel that they go back and like everybody is like you know it, the the big buff guys trying to be like a bully and everything and they're like dude that's not cool man like yeah 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 <laughs> like suddenly it's like the people who are woke are the bullies you know the, they're like literally like bullying people into freaking you know being nice <laughs> and like that's the joke right it's like such a role reversal um and and uh like yeah i i see that with kids all the time right that's the when i was uh when i, I first started teaching um in uh at the college level um no, I shouldn't say teaching, uh, proctoring, I guess would be the correct term. Um, you know, it was a very different thing. And this is in California, right? I was at, at Cal Poly in 2015. I was uh, proctoring, um, 2014. And the, uh, and I've seen this major shift in terms of just like what they're writing, what they're talking, uh, what they are concerned about. And yes, of course, they've always been, uh, fairly left leaning at the college level. That's just what college kids are. Um, but the uh, uh, the concern over social issues has moved from, um, you know, like I have a particular political perspective to like, let's just stop all of this hatred. <laughs> And that's that seems to be uh, where the kids are going, right? Um, I think it's just because students today, I mean, I'm looking at it just from the high school perspective, obviously, but high school students today are just so inundated with all of these topics, with transgenderism, intersexuality, um, 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 asexuality, um, and then other topics beyond that. And that at this point, they're just so used to it that they just see it as their status quo which counters level. which which counters all these um right-leaning folks who say oh it's a social contagion it, like well how is it a social who? Con how is it a social contagion when it's like just like getting gas at the gas right, station exactly it's just something like it, that's there it's a social contagion for who right if you again, yeah, like yeah, the, that, that, we, okay, yeah, right, like, 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 like what Miss Terry was saying, like, uh, you're inspiring uh, nightmares. To speak. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that's referring to. <laughs> Probably something you said earlier. Yeah, but no, but you're, <laughs> but you're right. Like they keep saying social contagion, but then the response to that was okay. Social contagion for who? Right? It ain't the kids. Kids are like surrounded by this stuff all the time, and they. It's like, it's like they can catch transgenders, and like it's like this sickness <laughs> they can get. Like Heaven it's forbid. so like illogical. It's if you just think about it for more than a, a couple minutes. And the thing is, is because students are are so. I mean, we keep using this word, but I feel like it's the most appropriate term. They are so normalized to all this. Yeah. I mean, it's think like about me. think about 2015, 
when gay marriage was was made legal by the Supreme Court. Prior to that, like the idea of gay people getting married in all 50 states legally allowed to do it. Oh, man, you guys remember the pearl clutching that was happening back then in, in a lot of these places, right? Everyone was like, how? It's going to upset the, the 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 moral fabric of the American family and this and that, blah, blah, blah. Two well, years are, later. There are plenty of conservatives trying to claw that back. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. Oh, no, forget that. Oh, no, 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 no. They oh. will not succeed. I will say that right now. Nope. They will not succeed. I, nope. And the thing is, is but but I remember that, like, that Clarence Thomas literally put that cool on reversal. the chopping block. I, no, no, I know uh, Clarence. Tom, I know what's, what Clarence Thomas thinks and what he says about all that. But it's uh, in terms of, like, I mean, it's if you if that does happen, we're seeing what's happened with the reversal of Roe v. Wade. We're seeing it politically. We, we saw yeah. it in the 22, 2022 midterm elections like that was like the issue that yeah. swung, swung in the Democratic Party's favor. Like politically, Sammy's right. Like you open up that box. There's no going back in the box. And That's, so these kids are going to grow up and it's just like, you know, it's just, the, and then there'll be something else. There will right. be something else that, uh, there, where bigots will be like, I can't believe kids these days believe this, you know, there's always going to be something and, else. And yeah. And, and, and like, and like we've all said, right. That's every generation. The four of us, as we get older, are going to be the ones at some point in our lives. I, I hope don't, not. I, I hope not too, <laughs> but at some point there's going to be, an album, a movie, a TV show, something <laughs> that your kids, my kid, when he's born, he like all this other stuff. Like we're going to look at it and go, what? are you expecting? Yeah. Oh, congrats. Thank, I you, didn't know. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I, yeah, I didn't say anything about it. No, he's uh, he's coming in December, man. Oh, congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. But I also know that when he's born and he grows up and he starts forming his own likes and his own opinions. At some point, he's probably going to listen to some album. He's going to be like, Dad, check this out. He's going to <laughs> be like, what? Uh, why? What are you doing? Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen to all of us. I mean, it, 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 it's, look, we, we already had our moment of that. Uh, our, uh, uh, I'm sure most of us all have to say dubstep. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know dubstep would came out when i was when i was in my 20s so like i didn't, yeah i was know. in my 20s too and i right, was right, right. like what the heck is this I, what is wrong know. with the kids yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i'm saying like that just happens with every generation but the fact that you have so many i, I just keep thinking back to the, the supreme court case when gay marriage becomes legalized and yes the initial take on it is just like oh my god but then like cut to two years later Gotcha. Nobody cares. <laughs> and that's just, and I feel like that that's the same thing that ha there, there's always a villain of the week, right? There's always like a, 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 a fear of the month on, on some, on some media yeah. networks. Right. So there's always going to be, this thing is going to upset the moral fabric of America. This thing is going to upset the moral fabric of America. Well, what about the thing last month? Oh, we don't worry about that. We'll worry about that when it gets close to election season. In the meantime, let's focus on this thing or that it, it's always going to be fear mongering used as a tool. Meanwhile, so, so media literacy is even more important. Like, very much so. But because younger generations, again, like we've been saying, are so plugged in, are so aware, are so in touch with what is happening in the world around them. And because they accept it and they internalize it and normalize it, hopefully that generation, as they get older, becomes the generation to normalize more and more social issues as we progress as a nation to the point where we go, Nothing's really that big a deal if you think about it. If it's going to upset yeah. some people, fine. Like nobody likes everything, right? There's always something that somebody doesn't like. But if 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 we will, I feel like we'll slowly, hopefully, I feel like we'll hopefully start to veer away from these giant moral panics. And I feel like that veering away from these moral panics is going to come from students today who amidst all the moral panics that they are seeing play out in school boards and in states and in the nation, they're probably looking at the older generation going, why are you so upset? Like, why are you so angry about stuff? Are you even defending me anymore? Or is this more about you? Look, I, mm -hmm. so I am actually in the process of reading so much on, uh, moral panics. Um, like I plan on uh, on making an episode about it. Nice. Um, but oh my god, uh, one there's there seems to be no just like book on moral panics. They're all on like specific moral panics, and it's like I no, I want like I want from Socrates to like transgender people. Like, give me that. 
Um, and that's your next PhD. <laughs> my next. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, Could you do, imagine so. just being so full of yourself that you just go ahead and get a second PhD? <laughs> Actually, I used somebody in my program that was uh, getting it. See? Um, like. I feel like I would hate she that guy. Could I mean, like she's. <laughs> Like she was getting, like she was actually getting a PhD for fun. Um, <laughs> Must be fun to have that time. Must be fun to have. Oh, that time. oh yeah, yeah. No, she was. She's. I don't. I don't actually know her age, but full gray hair, right? Okay. Um, but like, um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, now it's the time that, that like, she's not. The, she's definitely not going to use it for anything. It's just. Like she likes knowledge for the thing about history right. and yeah. publishing history and stuff like that. Yeah, you know? um, just coming coming from a sociology degree to a uh, to a history degree. Nice. Um, but um, the uh, the uh, I'm wow, I'm lost where I was going. Um, because <laughs> talking about uh, moral panics. You're talking moral about panics. About thank you. Right. Um, <laughs> so moral panics are not are certainly not something new. I mean, you know, the key thing is always once somebody think about the children, right? Like that's uh, that that Simpsons clip, right? Yeah. Um, but what was Socrates convicted of? Corrupting the youth. This is not something new. This is not something going away. The next generation will have their own moral panics. This is uh, this is not uh, like we should never say never, right? I, but I I also like to think that because we're all teachers, we're all educators, we're all creators, we're all aiming to hopefully inspire the next generation that are coming up. I want to have hope that. <laughs> I, I, it's it's tough. Trust me. I, I know yeah. the I know the landscape in which we live in today, politically, culturally, socially, economic, all that stuff. But I want to have hope that the generations that are on the come up, the next ones that can vote, they sort of look at the world we live in now. They look at these moral panics. They look at the people that are freaking out of school boards that are picketing outside of like, you know, uh, places where um, 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 displaced immigrants are trying to get housing in, in urban cities. And they're like, save our neighborhood from what it's like, I'm hoping that these new generations just look at how ridiculous these moral panics are and the people that are constantly carrying them out as sort of like this, like crusade, they look at the ridiculousness of it and they go, I pray to whatever God that I do or don't believe in that I will never ever do that <laughs> because, and, and I hope that we as teachers and specifically as history teachers can show them Here's how people reacted when these immigrants came to America. Here's how these people reacted when this thing came into play. Here's how these people reacted when uh, in, in Tulsa, the Stono Rebellion, the D.C. Acts, whatever it is. I hope that they are able to take those stories and take those moments in U.S. history and think about them and learn how to apply them to today's landscape so that they can go, okay, Clearly, this is a thing that has been happening time and time and time again. How do we become that generation to slow that down? Not stop it, because you can't stop it overnight. It's not going to happen. But how can we at least slow it down? If they can start doing that, we are on the right path at that point. And I hope that it's because of what we teach in the classroom, what we talk about in videos, what we talk about on social media that helps to at least give them a guide to start thinking about our, our current situation in those particular terms. Yeah. Well, put. That's a heck of a, uh, Amen, brother <laughs> statement. Uh, so does anybody want to add to that or is that, a, that seems like a good place to call it. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's an optimistic uh, way yeah. to end it. I mean, you just I have mean, to, as uh, as who was the one who prompted that? Uh, as th oh wait, no, that, that's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> now you stop. Now you stop. <laughs> that was the wrong one. <laughs> but as as Jacko Taco uh, 
prompted like there is hope there, there absolutely is and and sammy i think you put it best that you know the best thing we can do is try to shape the future in a way that will encourage um, people to to be more informed, more thoughtful in their um, engagement with such uh, moral panics and everything, and hopefully see an end to it. Um, so uh, unless you guys have anything else to add... Oh. MCTMA, make critical thinking. Uh, no, MC. I'm sorry, I'm, I messed it up. Uh, make critical thinking great again. That's really what I was trying to say. Uh, what's the uh, MCTG? We did that. There Wait, we go. When, when, when was that? When uh, we... <laughs> 1995. There when was did that one, just that one year, and then it kind of okay. took a little break. Just once, and then it went away. It was a passing <laughs> fad at best. There's always an interesting thing when it comes to like, you know, when was it great? But the, also, like, that's not just a, you know, because Reagan got elected go, or saying make America great again. Right? Right, right. But what was interesting is often how we date that, right? Like the, uh, uh, I, this is a completely off topic. Yeah. <laughs> where are you going with this? This could be another hour here. Hold exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you're going to talk uh, about Wilson, I, aren't you? You're going to uh, bring up fucking Woodrow Wilson, aren't you? No, <laughs> uh, I was going to talk about the new deal. Um, All right. That we have this new deal consensus and that's really, this relates to everything, right? Um, that we had this New Deal consensus all the way into the early 1970s, and it fell apart, right? Um, then we had this whole crisis of confidence, and then Reagan represents the rise of neoliberalism, neoconservatism, and the religious right. Um, and it's really that that three-legged stool of right-wing ideology, the, the new right, uh, that defines what we are basically arguing against this entire time, right? Especially the culture war aspect of it. Um, so there is this long standing arc there, but we should never get complacent. We should never believe that the, that the arc of history always bends towards the correct way or whatever the saying is. No, history regresses all the time. Um, but we can do something about that. We can create good mm -hmm. videos that help teachers uh, in the classroom when they are, um, you know, frozen in place and give access to students who are very curious. And that will hopefully spawn a uh, much better generation than ours. Bridge. Well spoken, sir. Yeah. Whoa. So, <laughs> I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, everyone, I hope you guys had a good time. I there Thank are you. links to uh, sorry, there are links to everyone's uh, to everyone in this uh, chat's uh, uh, channels in the description. Ms. Terry, I will be adding yours as soon as I can. Terry, it's, and, it's easy. And uh, be sure to go check out their channels. Uh, US 101 will be making more videos soon, so don't yeah. be discouraged by that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hey, awesome. school's about to start. You better yes. hurry. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> the summer ran away from us. I know. I know. <laughs> and hopefully everybody got something great out of this and uh, got a new perspective on what is going on in terms of all this anti-education stuff. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Good night. Take care, guys. Good night. And good luck. Nice. <laughs>